Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the March 1st, 2022 meeting of the San Luis Coastal Unified School District Board of Trustees. At this time, we'd like to ask those in attendance to please keep your videos off and audio muted unless you're presenting information or speaking in public comment. And this is for people who would be joining us through uh, the Zoom platform. We're offering translation services for our Spanish speaking attendees. To access translation, please click on the globe at the bottom of your screen and then language. At this time, we'd like to ask if anyone who needs translation could please click on the participants icon at the bottom of your screen and raise your hand. Buenas tardes, uh, bienvenidos a esta junta de uh, la mesa directiva del consejo escolar. Eh, es, les vamos a pedir como siempre que por favor mantengan sus uh, pantallas apagadas y sus uh, micrófonos también y que levanten la mano en la sección de participantes para yo saber si es que necesitan los servicios o no. Gracias. Thanks. Okay. The board met in closed session and we had two, two items in closed session. One was personnel review and possible action on employment, dismissal or discipline of district employees. And the second was a conference with our labor negotiators regarding agency designated representatives, our legal counsel and Dan Block, director of human resources regarding our employee organizations, CSEA, uh, SEIU and SLCTA. Okay, um, I'd like to move to item 5.02 and that's the consensus on the order of business. And I'm going to recommend that we move item 9.01, which is a discussion of the uh, resolution regarding masks to uh, at following item 6.02, which is our student representative actually, which is our Morro Bay High School program highlights. Um, I see we have a number of people here, and I think we have a number of people who are watching the meeting on Zoom, and I want to make sure that um, we get to that and um, are able to uh, make sure that we have a robust discussion on that, and let's do it early so folks who wish to go home or who have children here don't have to necessarily sit through a whole lot of other things in order to get to what is probably very important to them. Do we have a consensus on the order of business? Yes? Okay, so we will move item 9.01 to uh, after 6.02, which is Morro Bay High School program highlights. Let's move to 6.01, which is which are student representatives to the board. Do we have our student representatives to the board here? And Mr. Unger, before we get to the- Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Dr. Prater, there was some, there, is there something there is something I think we need to add and something you and I had talked about. Thank you very much. Yeah, if that's okay. I, yes, please. Um, if I would like, if I could offer a moment of silence for the, um, the people of Ukraine and uh, any families or um, members of our community that have been impacted by that, that would be most appreciated. Thank you, Dr. Prater. Thank you. And Mr. Unger, uh, just a point of clarification. This is my mistake. Um, the Morro Bay High School um, program highlights, it actually is a mistake. It's okay. CL Smith highlights this evening. And my apologies. That was my fault. Okay. So we'll do 9.01 after the CL Smith uh, program highlights. Um, Nick, I see you're there. Nick, are you, are you ready to go? Yep, I'm ready. Cool, so our annual dance fusion show is this Friday and Saturday. And if any of you from the board would like to attend, um, let Mr. Scaldi or Ms. Bray know. The show is at 6 p.m. on Friday and 4 p.m. on Saturday. And the show will be outside in our quad. There's gonna be several performers um, along with the dance fusion team. We're even gonna have um, a performance from Monarch Grove Elementary School and a couple bands as well. And then I will be one of the MCs as long as, as well as Leah St. Arnaud, my vice president. So that'll be really fun. 
And then we had two mock trial teams this year, which I've uh, mentioned before. Both had winning records, and the blue team was undefeated as they went to the county finals. Uh, both teams did really well, but in the end, we were the runner-up, which is still really good. And then winter sports are all wrapped up, and all but one of our teams made it to the playoffs. Girls basketball were league champs. Girls soccer made it to the third round of the playoffs. Boys wrestling was undefeated. And seven of the students made it to the master's level. And then Wesley Wilson competed at the state championship and went farther than any wrestling person from Morro Bay in over 20 years. And then next year, he's going to be wrestling for Cal Poly. And then something new in the world of Morro Bay is student congress. And that's basically um, a collection of representatives from each class. Um, it's during fourth period. And the goal is to upkeep communication with students and representatives from all through the school, as well as through like school officials and stuff. Uh, we had our first meeting last week and we brainstormed and prioritized things that students would like to see improved. And we also created a list of things uh, that are doing really good at our school. So yeah, that's pretty exciting. And then lastly, most of our students have begun the process for registering for next year. Uh, there's a lot of excitement for juniors, sophomores, freshmen, and then seniors are pretty nervous about college acceptances, but those are starting to come in this month. Um, yeah, so pretty good. Any questions from the board that I can answer? Questions? Could, who was the, what was the name of the wrestler again who did really well or is that? Yeah, his name is Wesley Wilson. Okay, yeah, um, great. Yeah, I understand, I know the family and I know he's a really great wrestler. So that's really exciting. Perfect, mm -hmm. thanks very much. Okay, let's move on to Lexi. Hi, Lexi. Hi, nice to see you guys again. Could you hear me well? Yes, please, yes. Okay. So, um, hi, I'm a junior at Pack Beach. So I just wanted to um, kind of keep it short. So we went over our SMART goals at Student Senate meeting last week. And um, so when talking to Student Senate, they, a lot of them wanted to like recycle our goals from last year because we weren't able to fulfill a lot of them due to COVID. So um, I sent out a survey to the kids at my school, asked them what their opinion is about the SMART goals and then what they wanted to see changed or what they wanted to see on campus. So a lot of them were in agreement of wanting to do a job fair. Um, I had a lot of responses saying that they would like to see a tattoo artist come to our campus. So um, we're going to try to work on that, um, as well as local retail, retail stores and like job opportunities like Target employees, CVS, Panda, Old Navy, and then like local pet stores. Um, to like just if to see if we could have workers come to our campus and just like talk to our students. And then, um, so the job fair will be organized by us student senators and then staff. So just making phone calls and asking them if they can come on to the campus and talk to us. And we're hoping to do that the week of April 18th. And then, um, and then a lot of our students also wanted hands-on learning opportunities. And those common response um, was our students wanting a cooking class. So we've reached out to Aaron Primer at Laguna Middle School to develop a class using their equipment. Um, which I'm super excited about and I think a lot of students are as well. And then other examples of like hands-on classes they want is music, auto shop, construction. Um, the construction class, the position was created and approved, but we're having trouble filling the like filling the spot. Um, another one was woodworking, childcare, and preschool photography and driver's education. And then our third SMART goal is our field trip, which is a cross-curricular and core specific. So um, some of the students had said they wanted to go to Channel Islands, Monterey Bay Aquarium, Hearst Castle, and then like local colleges within two to three hours, as well as like museums, like art and history museums. So we're hoping to fulfill most of these goals this year. And if not, we're going to bring them into the next school year. That's it. Is there any questions I could answer from the thank board? You. Any questions? Well, thank you very much, Lexi. We really appreciate it. Um, I see Noah's not here, but Grace, do you want to talk to us about what's going on at San Luis Obispo High School? Yeah, I actually have a slideshow. Is there a way for me to share my screen? I think. Let me try it. Perfect. Um, here we go. Okay. 
Do you guys see it? Okay, so to start, we have, we had a very successful winter formal dance this past month. It had almost 400 students attend, which was really difficult to get past all like the COVID protocols. We ended up having to push it back about like two weeks because of like the surge that went up, but it ended up being really successful. It was our first time ever having a student, our first time ever having a student DJ, which went really good. We saved a lot of money and the kids and students liked it a lot more because they got to like, they did like personal shout outs and it just, it went really well. So that was really successful. And then our intramurals have been a big thing that we've implemented a few years ago, but we really have gone off this year with them. It's like our goal is to create a community on campus within for the students who really don't have like a designated group they go to or an idea, or an idea for what they do for lunch. So we've been making games such as like dodgeball, cup pong, March Madness, which is coming up for this next month. And they've been really successful. Like we had over 24 dodgeball teams, 32 cup ball teams, 32 cup pong teams and just overall like a lot of success with that and we've been getting other programs in on this besides just our ASB class such as we have our intro to leadership class they built the cornhole boards and then our fashion design class made the little bags that they toss so it's been really good to get different classes to participate in this and help create our lunch community and then we had a really successful winter rally here's some pictures of it and it was mainly there to recognize our athletics and academics for all the hard work they put in and we had staff and student participation and it was really fun our sports teams our spring sports have just kicked off and our winter sports finished off really well our girls soccer team made it to finals in cif they lost by two but they did really well and then one of our wrestlers cash moved on really far and he's doing re being really successful and then our spring sports is just starting with track, baseball, swimming, softball, golf, and tennis. So yeah, they're underway and our teams are looking really strong. Our robotics team just won a big robotics tournament at Cal Poly. They qualified for state in La Verne this weekend. So we wish them luck. And then our drama program is working really hard on their play Wizard of Oz, which is playing in a few weekends. So that should be really exciting. And then, yeah, does anyone have any questions? Great, Grace, thank you. Anybody have questions for Grace? Uh, Catherine. Uh, may I ask if you know when Wizard of Oz is gonna be um, up and going? <clears throat> um, I believe it's in, I know it's it's not next weekend. I believe it's the weekend after, but I'm not completely positive. I wouldn't take my word fully on that. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's see, let's move to 6.02. This would be CL Smith highlights, Dr. Prater. Yeah. Oh, I got I'm it. sorry, Mr. Yeah, good evening. Field. As Dr. Prater mentioned, we have CL Smith on the docket tonight and Morro Bay High School will be at the next meeting. Uh, and Principal Aaron Black is here and he'll introduce a couple of his students. Excellent. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, had the opportunity to come and speak to the board about some of the highlights of at CL Smith. I can just share that the students have been working extremely hard. We're gaining a lot of ground from our missed time away from each other. Also having a lot of fun. So it's nice that things are starting to open back up and we can have our activities again uh, and, and, and present those different uh, fun events for our students. Uh, we had our talent show this past month. Um, we did some were virtual and some were in person in the gym, but we did it all virtual and sent out to parents. Um, last Friday, we had our fun run. So it was great to bring that back after three years outside. The kids had a blast. And then we also teamed up with the Cal Poly Lion Dancers for the Chinese New Year's. They came that afternoon and did a performance for us. Um, our students have been working extremely hard in their behavior as well and earned their galactic credits. So they got to duct tape me to the wall on Friday. So that was a lot of fun for them to get to watch and see. Um, and many more things coming up. Um, I do have uh, two students here to speak, and I'm pretty sure you'd rather hear from them than myself. But we were able to bring our STEAM classes back that we had three years ago. So um, our first student is Lindsay Madagascar. She's going to talk a little bit about our STEAM courses. Hello, my name is Lindsay, and today I'm going to talk about STEAM. First one is ballet for critical. It's fun, get to dance, get to perform at open house. Other classes are construction, yearbook, newspaper, cooking, improv, video, video game coding, gardening, bracket build, and bridge building. Five Fridays per semester. Create 
project to show to showcase at open house. Awesome, Lindsay. Thank you. Um, just a just a little uh, taste of all the different classes that our teachers are providing for our third through sixth graders, uh, student choice, and uh, it's been a lot of fun to be be able to bring that back and give them some enrichment courses to to lead them into what you're hearing about what's happening at Slow High, Moral Bay High, you know those types of things. My next student is Mirna Arguetta. She's here to talk a little bit about um, our our basketball team that we put together. So, Mirna, you ready? They set up a fifth grade through six girls team and boys team. They we played six games against other schools. We had lots of fun. We built teamwork, allowed us to work together, supported me in being more outgoing and less shy, helped all students focus in class and being engaged in school. It also helped socialize with kids learn more skills about sports and different ways you can improve in other, in other sports. Awesome, Marina, thank you. Um, yeah, just some fun uh, activities, getting our students out there, uh, building that teamwork on campus, seeing them grow together uh, has been kind of a focus of that. Uh, just kind of beginning steps of what we're trying to do, so. Do you guys have any questions for what's going on at CL Smith or for our students? Any questions? Well, thank you, Mr. Black. Um, it's great to hear from you and great to hear from the students at CL Smith Elementary School. It's a great school. Go Superstars. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Okay. So now we'll move to item 9.01. And um, I want to read a statement before we begin on that, before we begin this item. So typically we only get a handful, if any comments on a particular agenda item. And we have a number of people here tonight, as well as many watching the meeting and quite a few who've submitted written comments on this matter. As board president, I have a couple of duties. First, I must ensure an efficient orderly meeting of the board. Remember, this is not a town hall meeting. It's a meeting of the board to conduct district business and receive comment on how it does such business. Second, I must protect individuals who wish to speak to the board from disturbance or interference. And third, I must ensure that board members do not substantially interact with speakers or members of the public during public comment. As a result and pursuant to board bylaw 9323, to ensure the best opportunity to receive as much public input as possible. I propose that we expand the normal public comment for an item from 20 minutes to, in this case, one hour and a half. This will begin immediately following the district administration's presentation. I also suggest that we adjust the amount of time for each speaker from three minutes to two minutes to allow for more individuals to speak. Individuals who do not get a chance to speak tonight or those who wish to say more than this during their allotted time may submit comments in writing to the board. So first thing, do I have consensus from the board to increase public comment on this item from 20 minutes to one and a half hours? Okay. Second, do I have consensus from the board to uh, change the, the uh, comment time from three minutes to two minutes to provide more opportunity for public input. Okay, very good. For those watching the meeting on Zoom, we ask that you keep your videos off and audio muted unless you're directed and called upon to speak by the board. This will allow us to ensure that each speaker has a chance to speak freely, and this will allow the public to view each other and the board. Now, additionally, I understand we can ask members of the public to reduce their comments to the board if they share the same viewpoint as another speaker and don't provide some other nuance or point to consider. However, in lieu of doing this, I suggest we ask members to raise their hand if they agree with those with uh, the speaker. And for those watching on Zoom, I suggest that we use the technology we have and allow today's viewers to indicate a thumbs up or thumbs down if they agree with the speaker's comment. 
Finally, public comment is a time when the board listens. Board members must limit their interaction with speakers or members of the public during this time. We note that the views and comments expressed during public comment are those of the individual speaker and do not necessarily reflect the opinions, beliefs, or positions of the district, the board, or district staff. It is an ongoing objective of the district to serve all of our students and prepare them to flourish as responsible, ethical, and productive citizens. In preserving this mission, we kindly ask that when making public comments, you refrain from the use of profanity, exercise tolerance of others and their viewpoints, and exemplify model behavior. Please be mindful that district students may be watching. You're encouraged to address the board and the public in a respectful manner, such as those observing from young ad children to adults are made to feel welcome, safe, and valued. As always, there will be no seeding of time. And if you submitted a written public comment on a topic, you will not also be allowed to speak on that topic. Comments of correspondence submitted anonymously will not be accepted. The board will not permit willful interruption or disruption of the orderly conduct of board meetings. Willful interruption may be grounds for the board president to terminate the privilege of addressing the board or may result in removal of the disruptive person or group. We appreciate the public's participation and your assistance in helping the board meeting, the board keep its meetings efficient, effective and respectful. Board bylaw 9000 requires that this board focus on involving our San Luis coastal community, parents and guardians, students and staff to be responsive to the needs of all students. As such, I ask that each speaker provide their name and specific affiliation with the district. With that said, we can begin with uh, in-person public comment. Mrs. Sheffer, can you read the names and we will begin um, with two minutes per person. Thank you. In the interest of efficiency, I'm going to read uh, a few names at a time so that some, uh, the following, the ones who, after the present speaker can kind of be on deck. Uh, first, I have Damon, followed by Nicole Dorfman, followed by Aaron Svensson. Is Damon here? Yes, please. Yes, sorry. Yeah, you need to come to the front. Is the microphone on at the front? So I think this is probably in your list of questions that you're going to address tonight, but um, I'm just curious with policy enforcement moving forward with uh, enforcing masks on children. I noticed that y'all came to a consensus to continue masking the children in classes. Um, in opposition to what has been stated by the government. So just have questions regarding that. Uh, moving forward, are you guys gonna be kind of doing it, playing it with a decision to vote here, or are you gonna just strictly stick to government, adhere to the government mandates? What do you guys have planned? And my, my secondary question, since I only have two minutes to speak is, is uh, I have heard, um, that Newsom may want to require vaccinations for students uh, that are going to be admitted to public school starting as early as age six. Will you be enforcing that mandate should it come to pass for next semester? Those are my questions, thank you. Thank you. Um, what I can answer for you is your first question, which is that this evening following this pre the public comment, we'll be discussing a resolution which will, uh, which will um, address the issues that you ask on that as to Questions about uh, Governor Newsom, I can't answer that. So are there, is there anything else you have about certainly, 40 seconds left? Certainly, yeah. Um, so hypothetically, if we're gonna mandate vaccinations for children six to 12, you guys, um, when that would come to pass, would be forced to enforce that, correct? I, you know, I, I think what I'm trying, what I'm gonna be telling you, and actually I made a mistake, but go ahead, I'm gonna let you finish. Um, as I explained, we're, we typically don't engage people who are dur during public comment. So I'm not going okay. to answer your questions any further at this time. I'll come at a later date. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, you know what, I, I really blew it. Um, 
instead of going straight to public comment, um, I should have had Dr. Prater make his presentation. Uh, so I really, so I really want to apologize to everybody and apologize to Dr. Prater. Um, I got ahead of myself because I know there's a lot of public comment, and I really know that we want to hear from the public. Thank you, Mr. Unger. I, I thought um, I missed something. So yeah, yeah. you you I'm, didn't miss anything. Okay. What you missed was my not uh, following the correct order of things. All right. Well, uh, good evening, Mr. President, school board, staff, and community. Before I read the resolution before you, I want to express my sincere gratitude to the Board of Education for your dedication and courage over the past two years as we've navigated this global pandemic. I am proud to say that you have always placed students first. I've seen that happen uh, in public and behind closed doors and it's never ever been quite easy. You will see that tonight is only a blip in a series of decision-making events since March, 2020. Along the way, we have tried to remain steady and measured in order to keep our school community safe and within an environment that is conducive to learning and wellness. These words are easy to say, but not easy to operationalize. So assuming the board approves this resolution tonight, over the next two weeks, or particularly eight days, we have three big uh, lifts that we will have to, as an organization, do. One is logistical work. We have to review our signage because the laws and the regulations and the guidance have changed. We have to develop, refine, we have to develop and refine our protocols. We have to train our staff and we have to communicate across the entire district system to make sure there aren't uh, levels of confusion and misinformation. The second thing we need to work on and do over the next eight days is provide time for parents and staff to determine individual health and safety needs, to get vaccinated if they so choose and to finally um, uh, make any last minute changes or adjustments within um, individual classrooms, individual family homes and systems. And finally, the third part is to address any amendments to the guidelines that happen between tonight and the 11th. And as we've seen, I'm working as quickly as I can to address the changing guidelines and guidance that comes from multiple agencies. We've seen guidance come out from CDC. We've seen guidance come out from CDPH, the governor's office and our local county. And with that, um, that third component, while the next eight days unfold, I, I will be busy making sure that we have the most relevant information and therefore we are, prepared to address what's in front of us. Tonight, I will ask you for your approval to the resolution as it is written. Now, if you could bear with me, it's a long resolution because we've been through quite a lot and I think it's important to hear it. Uh, so we've taken some time to write um, a multi-page resolution that tells our story as to why we are here tonight. And I think if you pay close attention to this resolution, you'll see that it follows a level of discipline, a level of compassion, and it's not just blindly following what someone is saying we should do. We are using multiple inputs along the way to make the best decisions we possibly can. Resolution number 15, 21, 22 a resolution of the San Luis Coastal Unified School District Board of Trustees regarding COVID-19 and student masks. Whereas throughout the pandemic, the San Luis Coastal Unified School District Board of Trustees or board has passed resolutions and approved plans to ensure safety of students and staff at district schools based on the best available science and data as well as guidance and orders from public health officials to ensure and protect the educational well-being of all students 
and to continue the performance of essential governmental functions. And whereas as a public institution of learning, the district and its administrators have tirelessly considered local, state, and national health expert input and studies in order to help the board understand key decisions related to employee and student safety, while also implementing reasonable regulations to keep schools safe and open for in-person instruction based on local conditions, staffing needs, available resources, and input as given by stakeholders. And whereas the board and its members acknowledge their role as elected officials supporting public education and that it would be irresponsible or false to claim expert knowledge on contagious disease control and prevention. And whereas as an example to its students, the district must remain committed to following all executive orders, public health orders, Cal OSHA regulations, and all other relevant laws that take precedence over the district's discretion and judgment. And whereas the dis this district's parents, guardians, and community members expect the district to help form and shape children into law-abiding residents who use civil discourse and the democratic process to influence change. And whereas the district acknowledges that the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in different experiences among families with some dealing with trauma related to the loss of family members, friends, and coworkers, while others are trying to cope with social isolation and loneliness. And still others are afraid of what the future may hold for their continued attendance at public schools based on how lessening restrictions may affect their medical condition or continued or new restrictions may relate to a personal belief. And whereas, since at least approximately uh, August 3rd, 2020, students have been mandated by a public health officer to order to wear face masks at public school and on school buses. And families have had ample time and opportunity to seek alternative educational options or a face mask exemption. And whereas, the district acknowledges that removing student face masks as a mandatory mitigation measure may affect or cause students and staff with chronic illnesses who are immunocompromised or who have underlying medical conditions to consider changes to their current learning or working environment because they are at higher risk of severe illness from COVID-19. And whereas the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has repeatedly stated that authorized COVID-19 vaccines are highly protective against severe disease, hospitalizations and deaths, and other mitigation strategies can be scaled up or down depending on what else is feasible, practical and legal in evolving local situations. And whereas the California Department of Public Health, CDPH, has identified face masks to be an effective and simple safety mitigation layer to prevent transmission of COVID-19. And whereas on January 21st, 2021, President Biden issued Executive Order 13998, directing the CDC to take action to implement public health measures related to domestic travel, and the CDC subsequently issued an order on January 29th, 2021, requiring the wearing of face masks by individuals on school buses. And whereas on June 11th, 2021, the state public health officer issued an order pursuant to Health and Safety Code Sections 120-125, 140, 175, 195, and 131080, and other applicable law, which required all individuals to follow the current and any amended K-12 school guidance. And whereas on July 12th, 2021, the CDPH issued guidance for K-12 schools in California for the 21-22 school year, which included legal requirements for K-12 students to mask indoors unless they qualified for a medical exemption and for schools to develop and implement local protocols to enforce the mask requirements, which included offering students alternative educational opportunities such as independent study for students who are excluded from campus because they will not wear a face covering. And whereas, the July 12th, 2021 CDPH K-12 school guidance stated that CDPH will continue to assess conditions on an ongoing basis to determine whether or not it will maintain the universal indoor mask mandate in K-12 schools. And whereas on August 23rd, 2021, the CDPH sent a letter to all school leaders explaining the legal requirements for schools to implement universal masking, claiming that there is scientific consensus that universal masking in K-12 schools is important to prevent the spread of COVID-19 
and prevent school closures and that the CDPH mandate is aligned with guidance from the CDC and warning schools that they will face substantial legal, financial, and other risks if they do not follow the CDPH's mandatory universal masking directive. And whereas on September 21, 2021, the board voted 7-0 unanimously with all members present to ratify a memorandum of understanding dated September 2nd, 2021 with the San Luis Coastal Teachers Association, which requires that all non-exempted students be required to wear face coverings as mandated by public health directives. And whereas on October 20th, 2021, the CDPH reaffirmed its universal indoor mask mandate in K-12 schools, citing child vaccination rates, high transmission of COVID-19 in many counties, and limited hospital capacity. And whereas during the 20, December 2021 and January 22 months, the Omicron variant of COVID-19 became the dominant variant circulating throughout California, which is at least two to four times more transmissible than the Delta variant. And whereas on February 7th, 2022, the CDPH identified that the surge of cases related to the Omicron variant of COVID-19 was subsiding and adjustments to mask requirements throughout the state, including at K-12 schools, would be revisited. And whereas on February 11th, 2022, the CDC released findings from a California study showing that from February to December 2021, individuals wearing cloth masks in indoor public settings were 56% less likely to test positive for COVID-19 compared to 66% for individuals wearing surgical masks and 83% for individuals with a K95 or KN95 mask. And whereas during a press conference on February 14th, 2022, the state identified that the data from the past two months arguably showed a decoupling of the COVID-19 case rate with the number of hospitalizations. And whereas on February 25th, 2022, the CDC released new guidance on COVID-19 community levels that measures the impact of COVID-19 illness on health and, and healthcare systems with each US county assigned one of three tier levels, low, medium, and high, along with suggested individual, household, and community level prevention and mitigation strategies. And whereas the February 25th, 2022 CDC guidance recommends wearing a face mask indoors in public K-12 schools, regardless of vaccination status, when the COVID-19 community level is high. The CDC guidance only recommends individuals in low or medium COVID-19 community levels, level tiers wear masks if they develop symptoms, have a positive test, were exposed to someone with COVID-19, or, or are in household or social contact with someone at high risk for severe disease, or as directed by a healthcare provider, and whereas as of February 24th, 2022, the CDC data shows San Luis Obispo County, County's COVID-19 community level is in fact low. And whereas on February 25th, 2022, San Luis Obispo County Administrator Officer Wade Horton and County Health Director Dr. Penny Borenstein signed documents terminating the through by county supervisors in March of 2020, which will be presented to the County Board of Supervisors on Tuesday, March 1st, 2022. And whereas effective February 25th, 2022, the CDC is no longer enforcing the requirement for people to wear face masks on buses operated by public school systems. And whereas on February 28th, 2022, the CDPH released new guidance for the use of face masks, which contained an announcement that face masks are still required for all individuals indoors in K-12 schools through March 11th, 2022, and required without an end date for individuals traveling on public transit, such as when riding buses. And whereas, on February 28th, 2022, Governor Newsom signed Executive Order N-522 to allow for a mask to be removed from school staff following March 11th, 2022. And whereas the number of positive cases and hospitalizations within San Luis Obispo County and California have been significantly declining over the past month and are likely to continue to do so. And whereas 
the district has implemented numerous safety mitigation efforts and protocols to decrease transmission of COVID-19, including improvements to air filtration systems that will continue as outlined in the district's COVID-19 safety plan. And whereas COVID-19 vaccines are now available for students five years of age and older, and COVID-19 vaccines have been available to district employees for approximately one calendar year, and 92% of staff have elected to get vaccinated. And whereas testing and vaccines for COVID-19 remain readily available at numerous locations throughout the community, and whereas the district has followed and enforced the student mask mandate as required by CDPH during the 2021-2022 school year faithfully and to the best of its ability. Therefore, let it be resolved, the district will no longer require face masks for students and staff in indoor settings after March 11th, 2022. Be it further resolved, the district will continue to comply with the CDPH face mask mandate for students on school buses until the CDPH order is modified. Be it further resolved, the district acknowledges that students and staff may continue to wear masks as the CDPH strongly recommends the use of face masks when indoors in K-12 schools. Be it further resolved, board policy 5131.2 recognizes the harmful effects of bullying. District employees shall establish student safety as a high priority and shall not tolerate bullying of any student or staff member. Be it further resolved, that the district superintendent is hereby directed to consider further modifications to procedures and rules implemented by the district and its administrators during the COVID-19 pandemic, including the potential to mandate uh, face masks in the future if the legal requirements change, and to summarize conclusions reached and changes desired within an updated COVID-19 safety plan to reflect the new circumstances and guidance changes. Be it further resolved that prior to and after March 11th, 2022, the district superintendent is directed to clearly communicate to parents, students, and staff the legal requirements and evolving recommend recommendations from the CDPH and CDC. And now I, I leave it to the board for questions and, right. or I will step down. Um. Well, I, I want to just check, does the board want to engage Dr. Prater now, or would you rather wait until uh, we hear from hear, hear the public comment and then go ahead and ask questions of him? I'd like to know what the board's consensus is on that. I'm interested in making a motion. And well, we, we haven't, you know, we haven't, we haven't heard from the public yet. Okay. So is it okay with the board if we go ahead, if we go to public comment now and then, and then ask questions of Dr. Prater after we hear public comment? Mr. Buckman? Yeah, I, I, um, following public comment, if, if we could um, have Dr. Prater available. Yes, um, absolutely. So we can directly address him at the podium possibly? Um, yes, that's, okay. that, that was my thinking. And um, I just have a question before even going. Does, does the public have access to the resolution? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right. So Dr. Prater, um, we'll be calling you back after public comment. Sounds good. Thank okay, you. Okay, very good. So we'll begin with public comment now. We'll take an hour and a half. Um, Mrs. Shepherd, do you want to go ahead and begin with the sure. re-begin with the in-person um, public comments? Sure. Could we have you cold door one? Nicole Dorfman, followed by Aaron Stenson, followed by Margaret Carmen. Hi there. I'm also going to request that the gentleman who um, went before me, who didn't have the opportunity to actually hear the resolution, that he gets to come back and, and comment. We'll, we'll, I'll deal with that at the end. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, first off, I want to um, thank you all for finally moving to allow for mask choice. This option will make a world of difference for the many students who struggle with wearing covering over their mouth and nose for six to eight hours a day for months on end. In listening to Dr. Prater read through the resolution, however, I heard no mention of these harms that parents have been alerting you to for months. I imagine you have received a hundred or more comments to this effect 
over the year. So why are you ignoring these harms in your very detailed resolution that speaks only of harms to children from removing the mandate? Is it because certain children matter more or that the needs of some are more important than the needs of others, as the resolution seems to indicate? Such a perspective is neither inclusive nor respectful of the inherent uniqueness and diversity of the student population. Or perhaps it's because you don't really believe what parents are saying. Ignoring these harms will not make them go away, but rather adds insult to injury. According to a 2021 Gallup poll, only one in three Americans have a lot of trust in our public institutions. The poll found overall confidence had fallen since the prior year with public schools experiencing the largest decline of 9%. Seeing how this board has dealt with the mountain of community input on this issue, these results should not surprise anyone. But on a positive note, you now have the perfect opportunity in front of you to gain back some of that trust. And it starts by publicly addressing the issue of harm in your discussion and then adding a section to the resolution acknowledging these harms, which is the first step toward healing them. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have Erin Stenson, followed by Margaret Carmen, followed by Lauren Williams. The resolution was just recently um, published, so I really haven't had a chance to digest it, but it doesn't change my messaging. Dear SLC USD, Dr. Prater, my name is Erin Svensson, and I am mom to three bright and lively children attending elementary, middle, and high schools within this district. I want you to look at the faces, some of the very few faces of the people who you represent and that you're making decisions for. It was just over one year ago that we all sat in eager anticipation, hovering over our family iPad as we attended a Zoom meeting on whether or not you would allow the children in this district to attend in-person school. Mm -hmm. You held the fate of my children's education in your hands and he, here you are, once again, holding the quality of my children's education in your hands. We were elated with the outcome of that vote on February 16th, 2021. I am so proud that you had the courage to open up the schools to in-person education. I implore you on behalf of the physical and mental health and psychological well-being of the children in this district that you vote to allow families the freedom to have mask choice. Please have the courage to once again allow children to learn unrestricted and in a free natural learning environment, which is what is best for them. Omicron has been a terrific gift to this community between natural immunity and those who have chosen to get the COVID-19 vaccine. From a policy perspective, we're done. Children are not at great risk of severe illness and death from this virus. We all know the statistics. We've all heard the data. Drop the masks, drop the vaccine mandates. I ask you once again to have courage. Please take the important steps towards thank you, allowing facts. Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you. Your time is up. Next, if you, if you, please, would you shut off her microphone? Please shut off next, her microphone. Her time is up. Next, we have Margaret Carmen, followed by Lauren Williams, and then Leah Bodley. Hello, I'm Dr. Margaret Carmen. I'm a chiropractor for 39 years in the county and I have a degree in biology and chemistry and I taught at a university level for nine years. So I come with that background. And I say two years ago when you made the mandates about wearing face coverings and et cetera, you did so with the science that was there in your face back then. But there's two years of not a unanimous agreement about that face coverings work. Other people are going to tell you that. I just want to say, please listen to other science and what you've been told. And that we've been told public health is about you get a vaccine or you wear a face mask. And I would love for you to look up the definition of public health, which includes diet and how you live your life and all these different things include public health. And if we just had children go outside and get sun and they took vitamin D and they didn't eat sugar because they're wearing a mask that the virus is one micron and the 
mass is like 50 microns, the fibers. And so the, it can get through. And I'm just rambling again, because what I really wanted to get here and tell you is no matter what, these babies should not have face coverings. I do chiropractic care that's four to eight ounces of pressure. Your cranial bones move throughout your whole life. And when those masks are tugging down on their ears, it is messing with their whole cranial bones in their atlas, which is right here underneath the ear, which where their vagus nerve goes and works all their digestive tracts. And the kids coming in my office are having such an increase of their ADD symptoms. And I was at a meeting last Tuesday in Paso and it was in tears what all these parents said. So please, no mask. I mean, give them a choice. Thank you. Your, thank you. Your time is up. Thank you. Your time is up. Um, before I start, just to let you know, there's no thumbs down button on Zoom. Okay. So um, my name is Lauren Williams. My background is environmental health and safety, which includes public health. Um, I had more to say. I'm going to cut it out. I'm going to say this. Your resolution does not talk about the bullying that has happened to kids that have to have to wear the mask when they don't want to. That is bullying. And that has been going on all school year. So your resolution needs to talk about that and how parents or how teachers cannot bully children into wearing a mask, how they cannot coerce them and they can't make them wear something they don't want to. March 11th is an arbitrary date. We all know that. There's no more protection that will happen if we keep our kids in masks until then. But there is still child abuse that will happen if we do. Now you do see yourself as written in, how do you see yourself written in the history books? As standing up to corruption, abuse, and hypocrisy? Or do you see yourself on the pages as corrupt, abusive, and just doing what you are told by the corrupt, tyrannical, abusive leaders? What are you afraid of if kids have a choice to wear a mask that they won't? I ask that you never put masks on our children again in school and you allow unvaccinated parents back on campus. That is not addressed in the resolution. I urge you to make a resolution to always make masks optional and never force a child and bully them into putting something on their face that they do not want to, that they will have to do trauma work when they are older or in a week, in a month, in a year, they probably already are experiencing symptoms from this trauma that you have in put on them. So never put them on our kids again. Next is uh, Leah Bodley followed by Kyla Grafton and then Wendy Sullivan. Leah Bodley? Yes. yes. Hi, I'm um, Leah Bodley. I have um, twins that are in first grade at Baywood, and I have a 11-year-old fifth grader at Teach. Um, in this resolution, as I read through it, it really did speak that we, that parents have had a choice um, if kind of if the mask didn't fit for them, that they could move on to a different program or that they could seek out a medical exemption. Um, that's kind of what I want to speak to is the fact that, well, for one, we had jumped into a Spanish immersion program. So leaving it through the year wasn't an option because we had kind of dedicated ourselves to it. And then also um, for my son who needed the mask exemption, I did seek out a medical mask exemption. I got it from our doctor and um, I sat in a meeting uh, on, in January where I had a um, district employee tell me that they looked over the medical, ma medical mask exemption, determined that um, it was not life-threatening, that COVID was life-threatening, and that they needed to continue to wear the mask or leave the school. Um, I, uh, it's obviously very emotional to me, but um, through weeks and weeks of working further, so we started the exemption in November, and um, just finally in February, uh, they decided that they would allow Sean to take his mask off while he's in class. But if he goes anywhere else, he's got to keep his mask on. And for Sean, who is a bright, smiling face, to um, think of him and see how his education has suffered 
and how he has been, um, how it's kind of turned into um, Sean's crazy mom wants the mask off of him. Um, he does just fine with the mask. My whole idea is, or my whole thought is, is that my kids are going to go through years of therapy to try and figure out them who to trust. And that's my message. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kyle Grafton, Wendy Sullivan, then Erica Howen. Hi, my name is Kyla Grafton and I have two children um, that are um, of age to be in the San Luis Coastal Unified School District. They currently are not because of the um, mask mandate. So we've pulled them out to homeschool them. Um, but I am a long-term advocate of public school. I've been on the PTA board at Del Mar and I'm very involved with the school. So I, I'm a, an advocate for a public school and I hope that you will um, reconsider uh, the resolution and make it effective immediately rather than on the, um, the, uh, the 12th. Um, Dr. Prater, I saw your letter yesterday that came out to the, the San Luis Coastal community um, where you said that when the pandemic began in March of 2020, um, that the, 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 the school district made a commitment to respect the available science and follow the CDC, the um, CDPH and the slow public health department guidance. It's obvious uh, from the resolution that you've done your homework um, and that you know that the guidance has changed. Um, and because it's changed, it's time for us to course, course correct immediately, right now before our ship sinks. And our ship is our children. <sighs> they are the ones that are suffering. And um, it's time for us to, um, to take the masks off immediately, not to just be safe, not to take eight days to take down the signs. <laughs> I'll help you, I'll take down the signs tomorrow. But um, it, it needs to happen now, it's time. Two years is too long. Thank you. Wendy Sullivan and then Erica Holland. Uh, my name is Wendy Sylvester. Uh, I would like to take you back in time to a rational time pre-COVID. It was a great time for most of the world, but it was a devastating time for our family. My daughter was fighting cancer. Chemo left her with zero immunity, documented fragility, meaning she was actually at risk of dying from catching a virus and common ailments sent her to the hospital for weeks, us to the hospital. She had the choice to go to school and wear a mask all day. What we did not have the choice of was for her whole class to wear a mask. It was not an option at all. Even when the doctors told us flat out certain viruses would likely kill her, we were not given the choice to have her whole class masked back then. Nowadays, some are arguing that we must mask everyone in order to protect those living with a vulnerable population. Well, her brother at the time was also attending school, but his class did not mask up in order to keep her brother from bringing home a potentially deadly virus to her. And suddenly we are making everyone wear masks to protect the healthy. Do you see a policy that talks out of both sides of its mouth? It was clear to me in our situation that we had to do what was right for our family. We didn't have the opportunity to infringe on anyone else's rights and force everyone around us to mask up. Our daughter could protect herself by wearing a mask in public or stay home, both of which she did. Wearing a mask all day reduced her oxygen levels. It was extremely uncomfortable, caused her much PTSD, hello hospital. And we didn't need to make our situation anyone else's problem. We kept her home and she got a fabulous education. So I'm gonna skip down to say, if wearing an N95 mask is good enough for an immunocompromised cancer patient to go out, then all the people afraid of error can wear those from now on. We need to stop thank, making thank everyone else. Thank you very else. much, your time is up. Next is Erica Howen, followed by Haley Bingham and then Andrew Bingham. Hi, I'm Erica Hohen. Um, I have been a teacher in preschools, in elementary, and up through junior high. I have a 
a child in public junior high right now and um, public high school, and then I have a college child. So we've been through the system. This is, as you can tell from my wavering voice, this is not something I enjoy doing at all. I feel compelled to do this by the lead of other braver people than I. Um, we represent a tiny um, sampling of many mothers and fathers and caregivers that really disagree with how we're treating our children. I understand that being a leader, which you all are, policy, you know, voters on policies is a difficult place to be, but I would urge you to um, do what is within your sphere. So it does look like the governor has allowed for us to now um, not looking like radicals, go ahead and vote and say, this is the time to not mask our children anymore. It's relatively safe according to the, the science of the day. But I would also urge you to remember, if you look back at, at history, that there are many times that medical professionals and administrators and people in office and lawmakers have made really bad laws. And we've deemed certain segments of our population unsafe and should be segregated from other parts of the, and they were wrong. And we know this now. So I would just urge you to not always just go with what the common thought is, but to search your hearts and realize that this is a tiny, tiny um, representation of most parents that I know that disagree with what's happening to the children and we don't wanna make them our guinea pigs and be on the wrong side of history. Thank you for your time. Bingham, Andrew Bingham. Hello, my name is Haley Bingham. I am a currently practicing pediatric occupational therapist, as well as a parent of a first grader at Monarch Grove Elementary. And I wanted um, to stay with my profession and ask also as a parent and with other parents here too and other professionals that our faces matter. Faces matter for effective learning. Faces matter for social emotional growth. Faces matter for development. Faces matter for human connection. Um, I'm here to advocate for our youth. We live in a mass society. And um, what is the impact on our children's learning, their social emotional health, their mental health, and their development while wearing a mask and not connecting face to face with peers and educators? In my clinical practice and also as a volunteer at the school, I have observed significant learning and social barriers. Masks may contribute to these issues. In class, I've observed poor attention spans, I've observed um, difficulties in hearing and following instructions, difficulties connecting with peers, teachers, parents, and poor self-regulation. I see other children that are withdrawn, that silently suffer and are downcast and who rarely speak to myself, who's a volunteer, to the teacher, to their peers. Are these observed problems all due to masks? We can't say for sure, but there are long-term effects of these masks. Um, I fear we have grossly undervalued the value of face-to-face -face interaction. Let's enter this next phase with open communication about the immeasurable, immeasurable value of faces and unrestricted natural human communication and interaction. Um, focus should be on faces, on education, natural play and interaction, not mass, not fear, and not distance. Let's rebuild a communicate community once again, and that value smiles that values and recognizes the beautiful human interactions that we can have all together Great. without Th the barriers of much. mass. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Very much. Your time is up. Thank you. My name is uh, Andrew Bingham. I had a speech. Instead, I'm going to get technical, though. Um, I love how this resolution started and how it ended. I'm very concerned about the vast middle of it. Let me tell you the part where I think it should be cut off. Um, here's, this, here's the statement I loved. Whereas the board and its members acknowledge their role as elected officials supporting public education and that it would be irresponsible or false to claim expert knowledge on contagious disease control and prevention. And then it goes on for pages to to tell a story. And I, I want to honor Dr. Prater's desire to tell that story. I think that's important. I think what it skips 
is the story of parents and students who have gone through this. You have tons of time to tell your story. I don't think this is the appropriate time to do this. We're so polarized over these issues. And I'm worried about the whole middle of this that I think further polarize, polarizes us. I don't think it's necessary. And so I would say, keep it dry, okay? I totally understand the need to tell that story, but let's not do it here. Let's end with that third paragraph and go straight to, therefore, let it be resolved. The district will no longer require face masks for students and staff in indoor settings after March 11th, 2022. I would urge you to please do that. You don't need to go into a whole history about what the CDC and the CDPH have said. They can speak for themselves. We can all hear. We've been hearing them from them for two years. We need to start hearing from each other. And let's cut out that part. We don't need it. Um, also, please, in, in the store we have going forward, give parents more of a chance to talk about the value of faces. This is part of the story too. We need much more parent engagement and meaningful opportunities for that. Thank you. Thank you. And that's, that's the last request we have to speak in person. We'll go to our Zoom participants now. If you wish to speak to the board, address the board via Zoom, please raise your hand and Mrs. Dawson will uh, let us know the order uh, to allow people, oh wait, I, to speak. But before I do that, I'd like to invite Damon back up here. So Damon, um, if you have more that you, you can have another two minutes. I'll save my comments for, for, for a future meeting. Okay, Thank you. very good. Thank you. Mrs. Dawson, do we have some folks who would like to address us on Zoom? So first is Carrie Lang, Lan, Langer, I believe. I'm sorry. Carrie, okay. are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? Yes, Carrie, and your two minutes will begin right now. Thank you. My name is Carrie Langner, and I am a mom to two children within the San Luis Coastal United School District. I think that's important to point out uh, since we have some folks commenting from outside the district. Um, I am a Cal Poly professor as well, and I have a PhD in psychology, and I wanted to speak to some of the disinformation that's been shared in these discussions. I have training specifically in the study of human emotion and facial expression, and just short answer here, the top half of the face is what holds the most information that we use in social interaction. Um, if you actually look at the science, that's what you would see. There is no peer reviewed scientific evidence that masks are harmful. Our world is now awash in anti-science, anti-vaccine disinformation. I hear the fear and anger in some of these folks' voices, and I understand that's genuine, but mistaking masks for the catch-all for all the difficulties that we've had during the pandemic is actually going to cause us more problems. Correlation is not causation. We have been through a society-wide pandemic and loss of life. People are stressed. Blaming it on masks does not solve the problem. Wearing a mask is a small inconvenience with a huge benefit. I teach in a mask. I don't love it, it's fine. My kids don't love them, but they're fine. Protecting those in our community who are the most vulnerable is the least that we can do. We can be a community that cares. And outside of school, families can make their own choices about their comfort level with risk, but schools are a collective space where my children shouldn't have to share the risk levels chosen by other people who are uninformed about the science. The California state man, um, discussion still strongly recommends masking. We as a district are allowed to make our policy stronger. And I urge the board to keep the mask Thank handed. you very much, Mrs. Langer. We appreciate your time. Next is Sarita McGrath. Oh, I did not expect to come up so quickly. Okay, I'm ready. Your two minutes begins now. Okay. I want to say that um, I've, I understand that many kids have had a hard time with masks. I am the parent of a child with a disability. I work for a family resource center that supports families of children with disabilities. It is, I, I hear the stories, I really do. 
My son has a genetic disability. He requires speech therapy more than any other child in his school. He's fully included in a San Luis Elementary School. And I just need to say that he has been okay wearing a mask. He's doing fine. And if he can do it, others can. Some can't, I understand. But I have felt better as a parent sending him to school, knowing that others around him are protecting him. Throughout the years, and he's in fourth grade, he has been hospitalized several times and we've taken him to the ER for upper respiratory distress. So knowing that the kids around him were being were protecting made me feel better and, and safe to send him there. Um, what I do wanna say is I look forward to masks going away. I, I hope that it goes well. I'm just crossing my fingers and praying to whatever gods are out there. I'm hoping that it goes well, that my child stays safe and that everybody else too. What I take the most issue with is the parents who are saying that the board has been like causing child abuse. I think our officials have been doing the best that they can in their power with the information they have to protect our society as a whole. And what I really wish is that there was a little more thought towards our society and our community, a little more thought about the we and not the I. So fingers crossed it all goes well. I do look forward to no masks, but I, I just, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the time, I appreciate it. Thank you, next is Ken Castro. Yes, I would like to keep now. Thank you. Uh, just to be brief, I would encourage everyone that is attending this meeting via Zoom to continue to attend these meetings, even after the mass mandates are done. And I think we should start talking about curriculum next. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is Miriam. I don't have a last name. Miriam, are you there? Hello, I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, your two minutes begins now. Okay, thank you. Uh, as a public health professional with years of experience with infectious diseases, it's dangerous, it's premature, and it's irresponsible to drop the mask mandate for kids and students in SLO right now. I have an 11 year old in elementary school and he does not mind wearing a mask, he doesn't care. His friends don't care. And most parents don't mind sending their kids to school with masks okay. as well as the kids, but we're outnumbered. There's a, there's a vocal you know, group of people that are getting all the attention when in reality, people don't care. And it is demonstrably false to say that masks are bad for kids' health. You can look in PubMed where medical journals are shared and it's absolutely untrue. And I've also lived in Asia where people wear masks preventatively without anybody making them do it. And one way masking does not work, it places the burden on the, on the immunocompromised and that's who we need to be protecting. And I wanna point out that the US has a much higher death rate from COVID than any other industrial, industrialized country. Right now, the US represents 27% of COVID deaths in the world, even though we only have 4% of the population. So I wanna you know, emphasize parents support masks, especially parents of color, like me. There's not a lot of us in SLO, but we want to protect kids. And this government decision was not driven by meeting our targets for low spread. It was polling firms for midterms Planning for midterms and polling swing voters is what drove this unpopular and unsafe decision. Uh, we have way over 200 deaths uh, per million per capita. Thank you, your time is up. Next is Devin Kuhn Choi. Devin? I said something. Hi, I'm a parent at Bishop's Peak and I'm the PTA your vice time. president. Oh, um, Go ahead, Devin, your okay. time begins. Sorry. Um, and I just want to uh, kind of piggyback off of that, that the, har the fear of masks harming children is culturally specific and xenophobic. We have decades of evidence from students wearing masks in China, Japan, and Korea with none of the detrimental effects that um, plague some American students. What we don't have is solid evidence about the long-term effects of COVID. And what we do know isn't good. 
Current research suggests that even mild cases of COVID in children lead to an increased risk of, of type one and type two diabetes. Just this week, I've had two different friends who had mild cases of COVID early on in the pandemic end up in the emergency room with heart attack-like symptoms, which turned out to be long COVID, appearing out of nowhere much more devastating than their original cases years after they had them. In the Excuse same me, movie, you, Devin, would you stop the clock for a minute, please? It is her turn to speak. If there continues to be interruptions, then I will will ask those people to leave the room. Thank you, please continue. Thank you, um, thank you for that. Um, in the same press release last week in which the CDC moved to strongly recommending masks, they emphasized uh, that people who are immunocompromised and people with disabilities remain at higher risk and are now left, quote, facing, challenge, facing challenging decisions about navigating a world with COVID-19, end quote. Our at-risk students shouldn't have to face challenging decisions about whether or not they can safely attend school. Our district prides itself on the principle of all means all, and that should mean ensuring our most vulnerable students are protected. I know most of you have received threats of recall and even death threats from extremists trying to terrorize you into siding with their beliefs. And sorry that is happening, and I don't want you to jeopardize your safety, but I'm asking you to side with the overwhelming majority who support common sense COVID safety, including requiring masks, especially of unvaccinated students, and protecting our most at-risk students and embracing our principle that all means all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Amy Van Brash. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, your two minutes begins now. All right, um, thank you for letting me speak. I just wanted to um, talk about the apparent different science that is occurring across the world with different countries and different states, apparently. You can go to any other state um, except for here on the West Coast and you will have no masks in schools and you will have more of a normal atmosphere. Um, and other countries have dropped every single COVID regulation there has been. So there's a lot of misinformation out there and people are spreading different things. However, when you look on a global scale, you can see that other countries and states have lifted all regulations. This is a topic where you're giving people the choice to wear a mask or not. To all the parents wanting their kid to wear a mask, go right ahead. You can have that choice. Um, to say that my child needs to wear a mask to protect yours, that does not make sense. You are taking the choice to wear a mask to get the shot. That should protect you. What I do should not affect what you are doing for your child. Um, the data just came out that the shot is 12% effective in five to 11 year olds. So with that number, um, it's a very low percentage. We had the highest rates of COVID when the mask mandate was on this last fall and winter, and we had the most cases probably in school for the entire year. Um, and that was with masks on. So let it be a choice, let people wear a mask if they want. And if they don't, then they don't have to. But I don't have, you know, <laughs> You don't get a flu shot for somebody else. You don't work out. You don't eat right. Thank you, Mrs. Van Der Your time is up. Mrs. Dawson, is there anyone else who wishes to address the board on Zoom? Okay. We're going to close the Zoom um, to, uh, co public comment right now. It is 6.30. Uh, we, this meeting has been in, in progress for approximately an hour and a half. I'm going to suggest that we take a 10-minute break and then uh, Mrs. Sheffer will read the public, the written public comments that we've received. So we'll take a 10 minute break. We will resume this meeting at 20 minutes till seven o'clock. Thank you very much.
Okay. Very good. We'll, the, we'll resume the meeting. Um, Mrs. Dawson, were there two other people that had requested to speak? Um, and if they are, could you let me know who they are? So we have a, a Dr. Janae, is, are you here at the meeting? Are you uh, on Zoom? If you are, would you raise your hand please and let us know? No. How about Kashit Laveau? Kashit? Are you here at the meeting? Kashet, if you're if you're watching on Zoom, would you raise your hand, please? Okay, no? Okay. Uh, Mrs. Sheffer, will you begin reading the comments as we did before? Uh, we have about 55 minutes left. This is from Dina Malloy, board member. I listened to the first one point. I listened to the first 1.5 hours of the board meeting on February 24th and must say I was very dismayed to hear the extremist viewpoints repeatedly expressed. I hope that you are using other methods to determine the actual sentiment of your community. I urge the board to lift the mask mandate when the CDC, CDPH, and Dr. Bornstein believes it is wise to do so. I especially urge the board to continue promoting and hopefully require vaccination for students. It is very unsettling to see the low vaccination of our younger students and this needs to be remedied. Contact tracing and testing need to continue. The quarantine and isolation guidelines provided are good. This should remain intact. Many speakers quoted Dr. Bravo when requesting to remove masks. To a person, they failed to mention that he has been a very vocal advocate of vaccination. Please listen to the experts and follow that consensus accordingly. Do not be swayed by extremists on both sides and by people outside of the community. Thank you. And I definitely understand that you are all in a difficult position. Next is Amara Sarov Levine. Again, I apologize for butchering anyone's names. Dear board members, hello. I am on the Student Senate at Los Osos Middle School. At our last meeting, we talked about the masks mandated in our schools. I would like to share my opinion. I do not think that the mask mandate should be lifted in schools, and I know I am not just speaking for myself when I say that. It would be very uncomfortable to have someone with no mask sitting next to me. Not everyone is vaccinated, and people might keep coming to school even if they are sick because they think COVID is over. Also, kids might have a family member or friend that cannot be exposed to anything they might stop coming to school. Please take into consideration the things I have stated above. Betty Winholtz, dear board members, so pleased you scheduled this item for a vote. Certainly the change in county procedures as well as the statement out of Sacramento make it apparent that it is time to allow personal choice when it comes to masking students and personnel. Please vote for freedom of choice. Marilyn Tsang, I am writing to express my support for the SLCUSD Board of Trustees and their dedication to students during these very challenging last two years. In particular, I appreciate that the board's decisions have been both science and values-based. What science-based means is controversial nowadays, but it mostly comes down to who conducted the science and whether their methods and conclusions are accepted by most other scientists. I appreciate that the board has been able to make this distinction and not be distracted by so-called scientific evidence that is not accepted as valid by most scientists. Consideration of values also matters, and I am thinking specifically about values that help keep a community a community and that encourage us to think about how other people in our community are doing, especially those who don't have the time or flexibility to attend board meetings and convey their concerns. Individual freedom as a value has come up a lot recently. Freedom is a, is a founding principle of this country, but not the only one. I appreciate that the board bases its decisions on values that also recognize the importance of community. For example, by considering the needs of families in our community who might be more vulnerable because they have poorer health, lack access to health care, or have challenging work situations. The input and wide range of perspectives and opinions that you receive from parents must be overwhelming. Thank you for listening to them all and then having the strength to make decisions that are potentially unpopular, but
but that are in the end based on scientific evidence and shared community values. I support and encourage your continued efforts to prioritize our children's physical, emotional, and social health, which they need in order to have successful learning experiences. Melissa Lapidus. Dear distinguished board members and district representatives, thank you for the time, thoughtfulness, and energy you have dedicated to the safety and well being of students, faculty, and staff across our district for the better part of two years. We have done remarkably well, all things considered, due to your careful and thoughtful planning, and I thank you. As our, as our state is lifting mandates and we see a shift in our pandemic programs, I ask you approach this stage with optimistic caution. We have only just recently started to experience a downward trend in cases. While that is remarkable news, please keep the mitigation measures in place. Each one individually might not be 100% effective, but together masks, contact tracing, testing, and access to vac vaccines are our tools for success. I know everyone would love to be at a place where no mitigation measures are necessary, but I just don't feel like we are quite there yet. I would hate to see more and more students and staff miss school due to quarantine and illness when this can be diminished. Thank you again for all that you are doing. We greatly appreciate all your efforts and consideration. Larissa Heron. Hold on just a second, Ellen. We need to reset the clock. <clears throat> Go ahead. Larissa Heron, dear board, I respectfully submit that I support making masks optional for elementary schools. I don't have a student in higher grades, so I won't comment on masks in those settings. Along with removal of the mask mandate, it makes sense to me that COVID vaccine requirements would be in line with other vaccine requirements currently in place for our students for things such as polio, chicken pox, et cetera. If two full families are unwilling to vaccinate their children, we may need additional safety measures. I look to you to collect the information needed to make a wise and informed decision about these safety measures, but I do feel at this time, more harm than good is being achieved with masks for our little ones. Thank you for your hard work on these issues. Steve Klish. I am writing to express my support for the SLCUSD Board of Trustees and their dedication to our students and our community during these very challenging last two years. In particular, I appreciate that the board's decisions have been both science and values based and that those decisions have followed state and federal guidelines based on strong scientific evidence that is accepted by the overwhelming majority of scientists in our world. I am one of those scientists. As professor at Cal Poly, I have served as principal investigator on scientific research grants from the NIH, NSF, and DOD and I'm also a parent of two SLCUSD children whom you have served so well. Thank you for having the strength to make decisions that are sometimes unpopular, but that are in the end based on scientific evidence and shared community values. I support and encourage your continued efforts to prioritize our children's physical, emotional, and social health, which they need in order to have successful learning experiences. Next is Gina Marie. I wish to urge SLCUSD to go along with the state's recommendation of having children be mask optional. If we can go to work, grocery shop, exercise, watch a sporting event, and eat in a restaurant all without wearing a mask, there is no need to wear one at school. We have many doctors, nurses, and therapists in our community that agree with the state's ruling. Please listen to them. Thank you for your time and consideration. Angela McKee. Dear Honorable SLCUSD School Board members and staff, as a parent with two children in elementary school in this district, I would like to start off by thanking each and every one of you for all of your time and effort to keep our children safe in the whirlwind that these last two unprecedented years have been. You did not sign up for this, but you have stuck through, you have stuck through with it. Thank you, we appreciate you. I know this hasn't been easy and is often a thankless job and it has subjected many of you to a lot of hatred and scrutiny when you are trying your best. Thank you for always keeping our children safe to the best of your knowledge and abilities with the most recent and scientific information available and especially without any external agendas interfering with your decisions. While these past two years have been rough on us all and many push to end mask mandates, I ask that you follow masking protocols similar to other institutions, such as our local hospital requirements. 
For example, if hospitals are currently requiring masks to enter indoors, please require students, staff, visitors, and volunteers to continue masking indoors for the time being. It was a rough transition to wear masks at first, but our children understand that it is better to be safe than sorry and enjoy their time outdoors where they have maskless breaks with their peers. Thank you kindly for your continued time and consideration for the safety of our children. <clears throat> Aaron Marin. I would like to comment on the agenda item regarding mask mandates in schools. As a parent of elementary and middle school children, a registered nurse, and an organ transplant recipient, I find the plan to remove mask mandates deeply concerning. I do not deny that the pandemic has caused unprecedented levels of mental health issues among our youth. However, I have not yet seen any credible evidence that masking is a significant contributor to these issues. On the contrary, masking has allowed many children with high risk conditions or family members like myself, the opportunity to return to school and activities. Without mask mandates, sending my children to school becomes extremely risky. The stress for the children who know that even if they are wearing masks, being in class with others who are not masked is a risk to their loved one's life would be immense and only add to the burden they already carry. The stigma that some children will face because they need to mask to protect their family community will only fuel the divide in our communities. Please consider scientific evidence and the importance of protecting the most vulnerable in our population when making this very important decision. We are trying to raise children who care for others, yet allowing a few misinformed people to make school unsafe for many is extremely selfish and sends the message that individual rights and freedoms supersede the rights of others to remain safe at school and in our communities. As adults, we can and should do better to set an example of compassion and empathy for our children. Kathy Railsback. Regarding the mandatory face masks for grades K-12, I fully support ending this mandate. The face masks should be a choice, not a mandate. Next, Megan O'Carroll. Please remove the mask mandate at all schools for all kids in the county. Please make masks optional for kids in school and all indoor sporting activities. Please make masks optional for all faculty. Follow the science. The CDC has recommended masks optional for all students. Many other states have removed mask mandates months ago. Why are we the last? Governor Newsom has lifted the mandate. Stop this insanity that is harming our children. Local pediatricians have spoken out and said it is time to take the masks off our children. Stop ignoring the face rashes, breathing problems, and psychological issues our children are presenting from constant mask wearing. Let our kids see their friends' smiles and their teachers' smiles. Enough is enough. Davida Mello, members of the board, please remember the oath you took when elected by us, the taxpayers of San Luis Obispo and also the people whose tax dollars pay your paycheck. You took an oath to represent the constituents in your district. After the last meeting on 224, it was abundantly clear that your constituents overwhelmingly agreed it's time to take off the masks. We have followed the guidelines of both the CDC and the CDPH for two years, two long years. And now both the CDC and CDPH have indicated it is safe to not make masks required in schools. The time is now to remove the masks. Let's respect the families who wanna keep wearing masks, but also allow the families that feel safe to remove them to do so. Through this, we've always been told to follow the science and that is still applicable now. It isn't, the it isn't follow the science when it's convenient for you. Thank you for your time. I hope you will do the right thing. Rebecca Kingman. My name is Rebecca Kingman and I currently have two children who attend elementary school in San Luis Obispo. Last night, I was able to tell my children that in two weeks, they no longer have to wear masks while at school. The look on both of their faces was one of indescribable joy. I've done everything in my power to make these past two years as quote, normal as possible for my children. To be able to tell them that one aspect of this crazy world we're living in was about to go back to quote, normal was such a happy and joyous moment. Only to have it dampened once again by a small yet very loud group of individuals who are for some reason hell bent continuing with masking at school. 
Every other state in the nation is lifting masking, but for some reason, be it political or not, which let's face it, it's mainly political at this point, we just cannot let it go here in California and especially in San Luis Obispo. I urge you to listen to the parents, listen to the children, and most importantly, listen to your gut instinct. Do not continue to force our children to wear masks at school. Make masks a choice and only a choice. Thank you for your time. Tina Choke. As a parent to a child attending a school in SLCUSD, my family, including my child's grandparents, all registered voters, asked the board to maintain the mask mandate until the end of the academic year, until a majority of our children are vaccinated, including those under five, masks are, are our primary tool for stopping COVID spread so that our students can have uninterrupted learning. Lifting the indoor mask mandate at this point is premature as our county positivity 9.5 and case rate 44.6 numbers are currently similar to the prior two peaks in slow August, September 2021 and December 2020. Given the low vaccination rates among young children and case rate, it is not time to remove the mask mandate. Not only are children under five still at risk, but my family also cares for our elderly grandparents in our multi-generational home in San Luis Obispo. Getting COVID for anyone is a huge disruption to schooling and learning. It's not ideal for our children to have a substitute if a teacher is out sick, nor is it fair to students to be placed at risk of getting sick, especially when we don't have data on the long-term symptoms that long COVID may cause. We know that mask mandates work, as a community masking approach prevents community spread, reducing overall COVID cases, severity of symptoms, and therefore reduces long COVID cases. Community masking protects our children, including children with disabilities who cannot mask and those who cannot be vaccinated, our teachers and our community. Our family urges the board to keep the mask mandate in place until both a high enough percentage of students and their families have been vaccinated and the community transmission rate is low enough in limiting spread, especially in crowded indoor settings like schools, classrooms. Our concern is that being mask optional will increase the risk of all of us getting exposed and increase the probability. Sarah, please let it be parent choice if they want their child to wear a mask or not to school. Please remove the mask mandates from our school districts. Valerie Neuschwander. Hello, board members. I am writing in support of mask choice. So much has already been said on this topic, so I will stick to some basics. There is not a single peer-reviewed study that shows masking in schools is beneficial. I have heard time and again that we have been able to keep our schools open because we masked our children, but how can this statement be proven? There are places all over the US and the world that have minimally or never masked their children in school with no significant difference in outcome. Based on CDC data, the risk of children between the ages of 0 and 19 years of age dying from COVID-19 is an incredibly low risk of 0.00195%. This rate is much lower than the risk of children dying from influenza. Those arguing for masks are relying on low-level evidence, observational retrospective trials, and me mechanistic theories, none of which are powered to counter the evidence, arguments, and risks of mask mandates. Any reasonable risk to benefit analysis of medical masks concludes that the risks overwhelmingly outweigh the benefits. All that aside, N95s are widely available as are vaccines to children ages five to 11. Parents can make that choice for their children. Please let me make the choice for my children as well. I hope you will make a choice to pass the resolution. Thank you for your time and your service to our community. Deanna Niebecker. Masks need to be removed. It's all right, that was the whole comment. <laughs> Lauren E. Members of the board, I ask that you implement mask choice as there is no significant evidence that non-medical masking makes a substantial difference in COVID transmission. There are several studies that show a minimal reduction in transmission with masks in schools, but nothing statistically significant. Moreover, most of these studies do not account for COVID vaccinations in adults and none of them take into account vaccinated children. Our country's policy is an anomaly. The WHO advises against masks for kids under five and selectively for kids under 11, 
and many European nations have kept schools open without requiring masks. Our children deserve the same. Kelly Osborne. As of yesterday, the CDPH and Governor Newsom announced that beginning on March 12th, masks are no longer required in school and childcare settings, but still recommended. This along with our local pediatrician, Dr. Bravo, and numerous other local doctors and scientists supporting and advocating for mask choice in school should solidify your approval of the face covering resolution on the agenda tonight. The CDC has also updated their mask guidelines for individual counties. San Luis Obispo County is in the low transmission tier, which the CDC now recommends not requires masks in schools in these areas. If we are following the science and the data, then we must continue to update our guidelines based on our state's metrics. The CDPH feels confident to move mask guidelines for schools from required to recommended. Please do the right thing and allow parents to make this decision for their own children. Sherry McKinley, thank you for your service. I'm writing again today to continue to urge you, the board members, to vote yes tonight to make masks optional. I'm asking that you please remember all the public comment over the last two weeks. The physical and mental health of our children depends on it. Making masks optional serves all on both sides of the fence. Those who want to continue to mask have options. Those who want to be vaccinated have options. We are in the endemic phase of this pandemic. I ask those who want to continue masking, where do we draw the line? Higher vaccination rates, you say. I'm not willing to keep the masks on for that data to come in. Pfizer just posted results from their vaccine study. Vaccine is 12% efficacious. No children ages zero to 17 have died from COVID in our county in two years. If not now, when the numbers are down, then when do we take the masks off? When do the children get to breathe freely again? What do I tell my children when they ask why we can take our masks off everywhere except school? The state, the CDC, and the science all agree that the time is now. Remove the masks, make masks optional. Thank you for your time. Rochelle Manuel, please make mask wearing for children the choice of the parents. Mask mandates for children is a form of child abuse. Children are the lowest risk for COVID-19. The science shows that masks don't work as reported by the CDC. These masks are causing harm to the population we should be interested in protecting the most. If their parents or teachers still afraid of this virus, they have a right to wear a mask and have all the opportunities to get vaccinated and stay up to date on their boosters. Putting a medical or cloth mask on my child's face should be my choice as the parent. I have pulled both my children from the public school system because of the anti-science believers who continue to push their fears onto the children of this community. We should not be sacrificing our child, children's well-being, both physically and mentally, so that a few parents with anxiety can feel more comfortable. Please, some of these children do not have a parent to homeschool them. They are stuck in the mask for six plus hours every day. Please think of them and how this is affecting them and their developing mind. This cruelty and utter disregard for the needs and rights of our most vulnerable and young is on your hands. Canon January. I am writing to support masking choice for K-12 schools in our community. We have reached an endemic stage of this pandemic and need to support individual choice lovingly and respectfully. The mental and emotional impact for our youth has been huge. I believe we will look back on how we have handled this with our lowest risk community with regret as we have seen a spike in depression, obesity, suicide, and cutting. Let's move forward as a community and honor individual choice. Amanda Mobley. Dear elected public servants and government workers, I wanna thank you for allowing me the privilege to hear you grace us with your way overdue vote on the district's likely illegal mask theater rules. I'd also like to know what the district's plan and messaging will be to students if masks become optional. You've brainwashed and lied to them for two years now into thinking a mask will keep them safe. What will you say now? Laura Graham, you have a great responsibility that is without question. Our children are within the walls of your schools more than their own homes, seven plus hours a day, five days a week. My plea is to make masks optional for students. 
There is no disputing the facts. What we knew two years ago about COVID-19 is not the same as what we know today. After two years, one, COVID-19 vaccines are now available for students five years plus. So let the parents decide whether or not they vaccinate their children. Two, COVID-19 vaccines are available to district employees. So let faculty decide if they vaccinate. Three, the CDC states that cloth masks provide the least protection and the CDPH no longer recommends cloth masks. So why would we continue to mask seven plus hours a day? Four, the concept of your mask protects me and my mask protects you is obsolete given the new information regarding cloth mask efficacy. Five, mask mandates in schools have resulted in disruption, division, and behavior problems. The harm of masks on our kids in school is outweighing any proposed benefit. These kids are fighting for their independence during normal adolescence, fighting to not be controlled. Now they feel like their voice is taken away and their face is covered. Can you imagine being in their shoes? Six, California eliminated the indoor mask mandate in most venues February 16, 2022. These same children go to outdoor weddings, sports tournaments, all, all weekend, camps, etc., everywhere but their own school. Seven, this is not right to mask our children in only one aspect of their lives and let them breathe oxygen every other time in the day. It simply doesn't make sense. Eight. Let's learn from the last two years. Nine, you will have strong opinions on both sides of masking. I urge you to remember who you are here for, the safety of the children. They need your voice to speak. Sandra Beckers, please remove mandatory mask requirements and let it be optional. Next, Nicole Azar. The California mask mandate for schools is an outlier and outdated. The World Health Organization advises against masks for kids under five and only selectively for kids under 11, and many European nations have kept schools open without requiring masks. U.S. schools that remained open without masks have not seen major outbreaks over the past two years. According to public health experts, cloth masks provide little to no protection. They are little more than facial decorations. Yet we, have now, yet we have had low spread in schools with facial decorations only. Some argue that masking is for the greater good. However, masking our children is not a damage-free intervention. It negatively affects learning and causes significant social and emotional harm. Masking greatly impairs verbal and nonverbal communication between teachers and students. Visualization of the entire face is crucial for social, emotional, and speech development. Nonverbal feedback is often how children weigh their actions and behavior against those around them, developing social and emotional intelligence and interrelatedness that is crucial to their educational development. Masking in schools was meant to be temporary and the children have now been suffering for two years, enough is enough. We know much more than we did two years ago and we know that cloth masks are not protecting our children. It is time to end this. Parents should be allowed to follow the science, evaluate their own family's risk, and choose to unmask their children. Thank you. Amy Hauser. I am asking the board to please support a face mask option to allow families the freedom to choose either way if their children will be sent to school in a face mask. Maureen. I believe that people should have the choice to protect themselves in whatever way they see fit, whether by wearing a mask or by alternative means or by vaccination. Since the vaccin vaccination for COVID-19 is available to every single person in school, I believe that masks should not be forced upon anyone regardless of vaccination status. Between natural immunity and vaccination, our community is well covered. The academic, mental, and social impact of masking has been detrimental to our children and masking has not worked. If it did work, then this pandemic would have been over long ago. Our children have suffered long enough. Please let them see the smiles of their friends and meet their teachers face to face for the first time. Thank you for listening. Brenda Lunsford. Experts have long acknowledged that 7 to 93% of communication is nonverbal with facial expressions contributing the most significant role in interpersonal exchange. The past two years of covering most of our faces with masks erroneously believed to help prevent the spread of COVID has dramatically hindered our children's growth and development. 
it is high time that you and I take measures to give them back their right to learn without the obstruction of masks. I am a licensed MFT with over 20 years of experience helping families with interpersonal communication and behavior intervention. I'm also a mother of three, two teen boys and a 20 year old daughter and have witnessed firsthand how incredibly challenging their young lives have been behind the masks. Please allow our children the freedom to breathe in life and community without the useless encumbrance of masks in school and in the sporting arenas. Thank you for voting to eliminate masks in school. Seth, I am a parent in favor for removing the mask mandate, leaving the choice to mask our children in the hands of the parents. The numbers clearly show masking does not work. The mayor of LA and Governor Newsom party maskless with celebrities at the Super Bowl while children are forced to mask. This, hip his, this hypocrisy needs to end. If masking worked, the Delta surge and the Omicron surge would not have been significant when compared to states or countries who did not mask. We know that cloth masks are not effective to COVID and N95 masks are made for adult faces. Kathy Peters. As a parent of two children who attend Slow High School and Lambs, I am requesting that masking remain a requirement indoors at school by all. Sarah McGrath. As the parent of a 10-year-old at Pacheco who has a disability and gets speech therapy and has been okay with the mask, I am shocked not, not that masks... We did? Okay, thank you. Okay. I am praying that my son, who has been to the ER for respiratory distress, stays okay. What I am shocked about is the wild accusations of child abuse from those who think that the mandates up till now, the ones that have protected my son, have been tyrannical. My son would be better without a mask. I know we'll leave them behind soon. But I think that, we have, that what we have done so far has helped me feel better about my son's safety. There has been no child abuse. There has been protection using the knowledge we have. And I believe the next one we've heard from. No? Okay. Um, Joyce Sang, as a parent with two kids at Sinsheimer Elementary, I've been listening in on the recent public comments. We are all feeling COVID-19 fatigue. I hear that we all care deeply for the health and well-being of our children, our families, and communities. We all want our kids to be able to attend school in person and feel that school is a place where they can thrive and feel included. For fairness to those SLCUD families with medically vulnerable and immunocompromised members and with little ones that cannot yet be vaccinated, it is important for us to continue wearing masks indoors and to get vaccinated. There is inaccurate harmful information that masks and COVID-19 vaccines are ineffective. Research has shown that wearing masks can reduce the chance of getting COVID-19. Given the number of COVID of counties COVID-19 cases reported, and that is just PCR tests, not the at-home antigen positive tests, and the number of those hospitalized and dying, it is strongly recommended by Slow County Public Health and CDPH that we continue to wear masks right now. The state and county mask mandate was lifted, not based on science and COVID-19 statistics, but because of political pressure. Not all students and families have had the opportunity to get vaccinated. Only 27% of kids are vaccinated in Slow County. While the data shows that most kids are not getting as sick as adults from COVID-19, 800 children have died from COVID-19 in the US, four times more than the flu over the past two years. In addition, kids that are unvaccinated are 11 times more likely to end up in the hospital than those that are vaccinated. I want to thank the SLCUSD staff and the board for all your hard work to thoughtfully keep our students and families safe these past two years. I am hopeful that you will continue implementing COVID-19 mitigation strategies that would continue keeping our students and families safe after March 11th. <clears throat> Laura Slaughter. My name is Laura Slaughter. I am the mother of a Pacheco student and Laguna Middle School student. I'm a registered nurse in a clinic and currently working on my post-grad certificate as a family nurse practitioner where I'm practicing in primary care. I want to thank the school board and, and administrators that have worked so endlessly to make hard decisions and have sought the best and most up-to-date science, which at times isn't a lot. 
things change in science. The way we treated a heart attack in the ER when I started as a young nurse is different than the way we treat a heart attack now. And in the midst of a pandemic caused by a novel virus, making policies and communi communicating rationale for such policies on ever progressing science is really challenging. Your resolution is thoughtful and all encompassing. I appreciate what you're doing. My question as we move forward in this gray area of a pandemic that isn't over, but as hospitalizations are showing is certainly getting better and better by the day is, can the school still offer modified quarantine? In particular, what if just the close contact is masked? How does masked and vaccinated change the algorithm? I imagine these are the conversations that will be happening in the weeks to come. Please also continue to contact trace and require testing. I know that every parent on this meeting is passionate about masks because they're passionate about doing what is best for their children. There's no doubt that the pandemic has caused harm in our lives, emotional trauma, a learning loss. It's heartbreaking. Yet it's baffling to me to hear masking called child abuse. Those of you that are educators and I as an emergency room nurse for 14 years have seen child abuse. Thank you for giving all of the parents a chance to express themselves. I support the school district following state guidelines and CDPH guidelines and not removing the school mask mandate before March 11. We did it. That's it. And I wanted to, to take a moment to really thank everyone who provided public comment to us, who has sat through uh, a lot of meetings, but important meetings. Um, one of the things that we as school board members really, really want um, is parent participation and participation in our community. And I believe that we, we got that um, during this discussion. Um, Mrs. Sheffer, I believe you had a comment. I don't know if it's time because I didn't do it correctly before, but um, I'd like to make a motion, a motion to adopt resolution and i'll second we well have, i we have we have a motion and a second um let's open it up for discussion thank you Ms. dobler drew thank you i also would like to thank the parents that took the time to come out here and sit here it's not the most comfortable place and also those on zoom and also the correspondence i want to thank all of the ones that use the argument of their own personal experience laid out their arguments carefully and thoughtfully. And that's the majority of the people. I do want to caution those few who attacked their opponent and said that they were misinformed and selfish. I believe that's divisive, and I would like to caution them about keeping up with that kind of um, ad hominem argument. And coming back to the uh, resolution itself, I'm happy that we have a resolution here. What I want to um, put forth is some parts that are very hard for me to vote yes on. And I'll just say what they are so that it'll be in the record. One of, one of them is that it says in one of the whereases that families have had ample time and opportunity to seek alternative educational op options or a face mask exemption. Uh, the many I've heard of a number of families that have had a hard time getting the mask exemptions accepted that where the doctor had to provide the entire record of the child before it would even be accepted. And even then, many of them have been rejected. I just would like to have that looked at in case we, God forbid, consider masks in the future. Secondly, the whereas that's says there is scientific consensus that universal masking in K-12 schools is important. There isn't scientific consensus. We all know there's not scientific consensus. Science is, is about questioning, is about there's no monolithic science. Nobody, any, ask any scientist and they will tell you it's about questioning and hypotheses and redoing it and, and testing it. It's not about everybody saying, yes, that is correct. Another part is 
where it says that the 92% of staff have elected to get vaccinated. Let's get real here. They were mandated to get vaccinated. So I, I would just like to have 100% integrity here instead of 99%. I know that everybody here has the success, the health, the best condition possible. Everybody wants the best for all of the students and all of the staff. But if we could just not do attacking arguments, that's a message for the public. And if we could reconsider some of the things in this middle part of the, of the uh, resolution. I know that this may not be the last we've seen of this sort of thing. So I wanted to make sure to get my words Thank you. out. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, uh, Mr. Buckman. Yeah. Um, first, I want to explain why I'm still wearing a mask. I, um, I really believe in what we're doing. I really um, think that it's important that we model for our children. And I'm going to wear my mask as I have to schools, to plays, to basketball games, until the day that students and staff can take their masks off. Um, I feel it's important if we're going to set rules that I have to follow the rules. I want, also want to be clear that um, before I vote that over the last few months, there have actually been little comments to none, either for or against. In the last two weeks, there's been some comments, and, and I truly appreciate it. And I want to echo both the, the other board members. And I, this ability to zoom into a meeting and the ability to speak here for me, it's the final step in the democratization of our country. Everybody gets to come. Everybody gets to speak. And I just, I also want to echo that, that I appreciate everybody that's done it. Um, I'm going to vote tonight. Um, I'm going to vote in favor of the uh, resolution. And I just want everybody to be really clear. Um, it's not the, it's not overly influenced by people that spoke at the last two weeks meetings. It's uh, influenced by the science, it's influenced by the research that's been done, and it's influenced by the fact that we've met parameters that we set this year, and we knew that if we met them, we'd be able to do away with masks. Um, and I think we are at that point, and I'm really, I'm really, I'm really happy about that. I also want to remind everyone um, that there's a section in the middle of this resolution that says this board unanimously approved masks, unanimously. And so there's no, there's no sudden coming around to saying, now it's time to take them off. It, it, all of us approved them, and hopefully all of us will vote in support of the resolution. So I'm just going to go on the record. I'm voting for it and uh, leave it to others to comment. Well, hold on just a second, Eve. Is there anybody else that wishes to, to uh, board members who wish to speak right now? Okay. Eve, go ahead. I also looked at that part, Mark, about that we all voted unanimously. We did that so in September so that the schools would open up. And the metrics and the measures and what we knew then is different from now. As you know, just from the past few days, things have been changing like really fast, moment to moment, and it's speeding up that way. So yes, I voted then so that um, I we could open the schools in September and um, things have changed since then. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Marilyn? You know, I, I am really, well, I'm grateful for all of the public comment that we've received. Um, and I, I really understand the position of parents who are truly concerned about their children and what they perceive as um, the detriment to, the, to their children from uh, having had to wear masks. I, I accept that, I know it, and if it were my child, I, I might be very concerned as well. 
But as a trustee, I believe that we have made, uh, from, from the onset, we have taken the position that we would follow the science and um, the CDPH and the CDC and Dr. Borenstein, and we have held to that and we've done that right down the line until today. And so I think I see no reason to deviate from, um, from the path that we've chosen. And I'm going to support the resolution and I am going to support in particular the part of the resolution that states that we give Dr. Prater uh, the latitude should things change to um, make modifications as necessary. Thank you. See, um, is there any, Catherine or uh, Evelyn, do you have anything to add before I go back? Okay, uh, Ellen and then Mark. No, I just, I know I made the motion, but I uh, didn't comment at all. And as everyone, uh, you know, I know the resolution was very lengthy. We usually discourage lengthy resolutions. Um, uh, some of us discourage resolutions at all, but this was an important moment. And I think it, what a long couple of years this has been, huh? Uh, six of us were on the board when the, dis the really difficult decision had to be made to close schools in the face of the information that was available at that particular time. And, and Eve, you're right, it has been a shifting landscape for two years. You know, we've often commented that we feel constantly that the rug has been pulled out from under us, you know, in one way, one way or another, either by uh, changing science or changing circumstances or seeing uh, different approaches to, to best address this horrible pandemic that we've been going through and that is continuing. Uh, we rejoiced, many of us, when vaccinations looked like uh, came about. Uh, we signed up, we ran out, we got them, we did what we felt was best for not just ourselves, but for our community and those around us. Um, and I, it's, it's easy to just think of where we are today that, and the last few weeks and the last little bit of time, but it's been a, it, there, we have all taken this so seriously and it has created, uh, I think I speak for each and every one of us, such, um, such deep thought and reflection and constantly looking at the information that's available and constantly considering and reconsidering and considering again, uh, what is best for our students as well as knowing that there were others doing that to an even greater degree with more access to more science, to more information, and that we chose as a district uh, to operate under the, the uh, parameters that were yeah. set by the, um, the- Can you hold on just a second? By the federal government, by the state government, by our county department of health, and to follow uh, what they had put into place. And I don't regret that for one second. There were times when you know, I felt, should we perhaps be considering something else? But I don't regret at all the paths we have taken. And, um, and I'm grateful to be where we are now that we're able to make this decision. Um, I don't know that I completely believe that we won't, that something won't come up to change it in the future because this is still remains as I feel very unpredictable that this disease is still very unpredictable. But I'm really happy to be at the point where we are now and uh, to have our kids in just a few short days unmasked and our staff as well and, um, and get back to um, going back to schools and thinking about other things than masks. Thank you. Um, Mr. Buckman. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, you know, I'm, t I'm totally convinced that this board's gonna vote in favor of this resolution. I hope, I hope we all do. And before everybody leaves the room or leaves the Zoom call, I have a challenge <laughs> and my challenge is, is we all have come together either on one side or the other, but we've all come together because of what we believed was good for kids and students. 
And my challenge is, is that I hope we stay together and we keep working together for what's best for kids. And some of the things I'd like us all to get together on is between 2007 and 2018, just one year before COVID, by the way, youth suicides increased 60%. We, we all need to address that together. New York and other East Coast states spend upwards of $25,000 or more per child. The last time I checked, California barely spends half of that. We need to work on that. The gap in learning between some students remains constantly 20 to 30% off of achievement. We need to work together on that. Students in San Luis Coastal, between 30 and 40% of them live below the poverty level. That's 30 out of every 100 students. We need to work on, on that. And California has the largest kindergarten to sixth grade classes in the state, where Utah and California are tied, in, in the country. That's wrong. We're, the, we're one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest state in the country. So I'm asking everybody, the masks are going away, at least hopefully forever, but maybe not, but they're going away. But we all need to continue to work together for these kids. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Mark. And, and by the way, um, later on, I, you, there will be a nomination for the California School Boards Association Delegate Assembly where you, for, where you will be able to continue to um, support and drive those and, and drive that challenge forward um, on a state level. And uh, by the way, uh, we're, we'll be doing our legislative action day, I believe on March 17th, where we'll be absolutely lobbying for those things because as you say, there are, we have a lot of challenges here in California. And I think that uh, I, I'm hopeful that people recognize that. Anyone else? Catherine? I just would like to say that I have tremendous empathy for the parents of our students and what they've had to go through and their children have had to go through during this trying time. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, I stand by the recommendations by the California Department of Public Health and the CDC um, and, their, um, and their expertise in this area. Um, we are, as a board, um, making the decision that we believe is in the best interest of your children and of our community. And um, I, I stand by that wholeheartedly. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Um, before we go to a vote, there, there are some things that I just wanna share too um, that I think are important as we move forward. You know, get the sense that the board will approve this. Um, and, and these are the things that, that I believe we need to think about, things, Dr. Prater, that I think you and the staff are going to need to be working on between not only now and uh, the ele at 11.59 on the 11th, um, but, but continuing on. The first um, is to protect our vulnerable students and staff. And um, I clearly heard parent concerns about their immunocompromised students. And I think about those students, I think about the students in special education classes for the public. Uh, you may or may not know that I was a speech pathologist in public schools and a director of special education for classrooms with the most severely handicapped, profoundly handicapped students in this county. Um, people may not realize it, but we have classrooms in this county that if you walked into them, you would mistake them for hospitals. And we have very vulnerable, very, um, very, very, just, I'll just leave it at that, very vulnerable children. I wanna make sure that we protect those students at all times. And finally, we need to make sure that we protect our staff and, and through extension, our community. And I think about the teacher at Monarch Grove who suffered for two years with life-threatening life leukemia, who I happened to be on a walk a couple of days ago and ran into her um, and how she's back at school and she's back teaching and what we need to make sure to protect her and her cohorts as well. Another thing I'm concerned about and that I wanna make sure we do is that we honor parents who choose to leave their children in masks as well as parents who choose not 
to want their children masked. We must honor those parental decisions. Another thing we heard about significantly, and I believe the resolution does address this, is bullying. We need to redouble our efforts to make sure that both those who choose to wear masks and those who choose to not wear masks after the 11th have a sense of safety at school and are not bullied. And I know that we have the bully, bully button on our website, but, but we need to make sure, as I think one of the uh, speakers said, that um, we're working for all children and kind of taking up Mr. Buckman's challenge as well. And then the last thing, um, we, we've heard a lot. Um, we've heard about mental health issues with children. We've heard about teen suicide. We've heard about um, increases in mental health concerns of kids. And, and one of the best ways I believe that we can mitigate that is just to keep the schools open. That kids, that out of school is not good for kids. That virtual learning, although a stopgap measure, is not what children need. Children need the socialization. They need to be with each other. We need to do everything we can to make sure that our schools are open, that our schools are attending school, and that schools are safe for all of our children. And I'll, I'm going to leave it at that. So on that, I'm going to ask for a vote. Um, we have a motion by Mrs. Sheffer. I just have to write this down. And a second by Mrs. Roger. Um, I'm going to do a roll call vote. Mrs. Sheffer? Yes. Mrs. Roger? Yes. Mr. Buckman? Yes. Ms. Dobler Drew? Yes. Dr. Eisendrath Rogers? Yes. Mrs. Frame? Yes. And I'm a yes. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to item 7.01, which is correspondence. Give me just a second to get to that place. We had a number of people who uh, corresponded with us last week. Um, several of these were people that were not able to be heard from at our last meeting on the 25th, and I want to acknowledge all of those people. Um, we'll move on to item 7.02, which is public comment. Again, this is public comment that for, um, for typically items that relate to the board that are not on the agenda. We have had a long agenda item and we've heard from a lot of public comment on that. I would ask that, um, that, that if you wish to make public comment at this time that you avoid that issue since we did receive lots of public comment about that. Mrs. Sheffer, is there anyone who wishes to address the board at this point? I have to Lauren Williams and Margaret Carmen. So, Thank you. Um, Margaret hold on, hold, left. You, hold, hold, Margaret hold. left already. Just so you know. Can you hold on just a second? Yep. Um, and we'll get the timer up. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, um, board. I am just asking you to agendize. Um, vaccine mandates, um, COVID-19 vaccine mandates, so we can have an open conversation just like we have had with masks. Um, I know people have put it in their comments, but I think it needs to be a separate issue. Um, I've heard Paso and Templeton um, did Zoom, and I was in person at both of those, and most of their school board members are against the state requiring um, children to have to get the COVID-19 vaccine to attend school. My hunch is that um, sometime probably in the end of this school year or in the summer, um, Newsom will, if the FDA approves it, it will go into, he's already said it will go into the next semester. So I would like to discuss that prior to it being an issue and you know the first day of school happening and we can have this discussion now that the mask um, mandate is over and that we can um, look at the Pfizer documents that are now being released saying that there's only 12 percent um, efficacy and really look into what has been released and what is the safety um, for our children and mandating it 
um, what the board feels on that. So I would like to get that on the agenda if possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mrs. Sheffer, who's next? Uh, I have a written comment from Jennifer Malinowski. Okay, you have a written comment. Hold on just a second. I'm gonna go to Mrs. Dawson to see if there's anybody from the public on Zoom that wishes to address the board. Okay, go ahead, Mrs. Sheffer, thank you. Uh, this is from Jennifer Malinowski. As an employee of SLC USD who lives in South County, it is difficult that my academic calendar differs from that of my children in the Lucia Mar School District. I know I speak for other teachers whose kids go to schools in neighboring districts. Would SLC USD consider aligning their calendar with other local districts so that teachers in SLC USD do not have scheduling conflicts that necessitate additional childcare among other inconveniences. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Mrs. Malinowski. Um, is there anyone else? Uh, um, do oh, it's the, the, what, you, what you're talking to me about, Mrs. Dawson, is that, is this, comment regarding um, masking and band-aid, then, then we're not going to read that. We will add it to public comment since we already covered that. It's already in board correspondence. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else? Okay, I'm sorry, I, I can't see. We're good, okay, very good. Let's move on to items 8.01, which is business and budget update. Mr. Pinkerton. Yeah, so a few things just to quickly update the board. Um, we had a couple of audit findings. And so uh, Katie Eklund and myself, fiscal director, have been going out to just met with San Luis Obispo High School last week to make those changes that were necessary, right, um, that came out of the audit. And we'll be um, actually at Morro Bay High tomorrow afternoon to work with their uh, principal, athletic director, as well as their um, financial secretary who, who does all the student accounts. So uh, making those adjustments now. Um, Ms. Frost and myself have, will continue to go around and, and have our LCAP meetings on a weekly basis. Um, so it's nice to get, you know, to get out to sites when we can. Um, we're, we're definitely trying to be in person for now on, right? So it, you just really have that, you know, kind of connection with the staff to talk to them, hear from them about the LCAP and, and what's happening. Um, negotiations are happening. With, with our teachers union currently, uh, as well as with SEIU, we begin uh, CSEA next week. So all three of our groups will be in the middle of negotiations and um, we'll continue to update to the board as those, uh, as those process. Um, kudos to Mr. Block for his work with meeting with our labor groups and, um, and really having a positive uh, interaction and, and meetings to start those negotiations. Um, Dr. Prater and myself got to talk with Senator Laird this week. Um, about TK and K and funding for TK. Um, as, as the board is well aware, there is no funding currently in the governor's plan for um, transitional kindergarten, um, that mandate that's coming to the, to the board to add another grade level to the school. Um, you know, a lot of, lot of things go into that. You know, not only the teachers, um, they're talking about a 10 to one ratio potentially, so instructional assistance. Um, th there's going to be credentialing issues with getting, um, making sure that staff has the EC credits that they need. There's going to be issues with ensuring that our instructional aides have the EC credits that they need. Um, there's going to be facility issues, of course, that go along with that. So there's just a lot that's going to go into TK. And, and I want to say we had a, an excellent conversation with, with Senator Laird. Um, he listened. Uh, he was about to go into a, a meeting that talked about finance and moving forward. And so just really appreciate the fact that he took the time out of his day to connect with Dr. Prater and myself and talk about those concerns and, and to bring them forward um, to, to the legislature. So that's great to hear. And uh, lastly, for me, uh, we do have a study session next week for the board. So we will we'll be addressing two um, really important topics. The first one is uh, we have concluded our hazard mitigation grant. And so that plan will be brought forward to the board for approval. Um, we'll have category five as well as Resolute and Associates there to kind of walk us through the hazard mitigation um, plan. But it's it's got through all the hurdles with FEMA and the federal government, which can be very difficult at times, but um, very happy to bring that forward and, and the work that's been done to, uh, to, to get that completed. And then lastly, we will be giving the board an update on our climate change measures since the resolution and um, the last time the board has dis discussed that. So we'll be bringing that information as well to the board. Um, you'll see an item today that has a, an electric bus, right? For 
almost four hundred thousand dollars, right? Um, and so fortunate enough that we we received that bus through a grant, so no cost to the district, um, as well as the uh, another grant that we received from PG&E to set up the charging stations for those. So really excited about what what you know will it work? Is it going to meet our needs as a district? Where we're going to shoot for it, right? Happy that we got the grant. Um, and so the board knows we're also looking at some um, electric, other types of electric vehicles. Um, you'll also see an electric lawnmower on the agenda tonight. So things that we're, we're going to update the board um, next week and, and just, you know, we're co continually making, um, trying to make steps to, uh, to, to meet that climate change need as well. So, but happy to share that next week. Thank you. Um, I just want to make a comment. Perhaps, perhaps Mr. Buckman and I won't want to pull that uh, consent agenda item. Well, I could. <laughs> I, I could save time later. Yeah, so, you've got so my, go, I, go I just, for it because you I know, so four hundred thousand dollars sounds like a ton of money. It, it is a ton of money, but what we're not reporting on, and what we may not know yet, is how much are we saving on diesel fuel? How much are we going to save on mechanics? You know, there's a ton of money to be saved in electric buses as well. So, uh, and besides saving the environment, so right. I'm, we, I'm, we look I was, forward to seeing. I was what really excited be, to yes. see that. Thank yes. you. And yeah, and, and I just want to I want to say how excited I was to see that as well. And um, I'm sure she I, I see the hand of Annie Sharp in there. Um, Annie, for those of you who don't know, Annie is our director of transportation who will be retiring this year. She will be greatly missed. Um, and she has really helped to move our transportation department forward. And she's she's pretty incredible, as is her department. So kudos to you guys over that. I'm sorry, Eve, go ahead. That's I didn't okay. see you over there. No, that's fine. Uh, yeah, I was going to have 1104 pull two about that bus. Oh, <laughs> I jumped on the bus. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I was going to say not in San Luis, but somewhere you could buy a nice house for that money. And um, do we get a volume discount if we buy more than one? <laughs> yeah, we'll see in the future, right? I mean, my hope is that, again, this was a grant. The, the reason yeah. why we went forward with this was it was grant funded, so it doesn't cost the district anything. Um, and we've been very good about going after grants and, and actually receiving a lot of grants over the past 10 years, I think, since Annie's been with the district and um, replaced a lot of our older buses that got like, you know, two miles to the gallon, those types of things. So, you know, a lot of good things. So we'll, we'll continue to look for grants to get them free, number one. Um, and, and I really, I think it's going to be important for us to see how it works and how it meets the needs of our district and the school and, you know, and, and, and how we use it, those types of things. I'm assuming that prices will go down in the future. So, you know, that this will be something with technology as it moves forward, those types of things. But as Mr. Buckman said, it'll also be, you know, to do that study of the cost of gas versus electricity costs and, you know, the, where we end that, you know, at least we're going to have a, a, an opportunity now to, to get to see that. So I, we'll see. Okay. Yeah. And and I would just acknowledge that Ms. Dobler drew on, drives an electric car. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> but a hybrid. I'm still not making the uh, complete leap as, of faith. As, as does Mr. Buckman. As oh, an electric I park, car. I we park. have another electric car user <laughs> yeah. over here. I parked right behind you with mine. Uh, I okay. should I should acknowledge Mrs. Roger who has a who has a Nissan Leaf, I believe. Thank you very much. And I love my car. Cool. Thank you. Mr. All right, 8.02 educational Mr. service. Oh, I'm sorry, Evelyn. I, I'm just like, <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Um, I, I did have a quick question. It was, is that, um, do it requires a different charging station or system? What does that look like? Just curious. I mean, I'm, I'm really excited about it, but. Uh, yeah, so I mean, we, they're at PG. So again, we had another grant. The only reason we, why we were able to accept the bus was great. we got another grant to put in the whole infrastructure for the electric okay. charging station. So there's actually, okay. um, so the pg &E grant that we received puts puts three charging stations in. So they came out to bg &T. Again, kudos to Chris Bonin, you know, Rick Simpson, so the rest of the BGT staff too to help facilitate this, make it happen. But they came out to the BGT yard, made sure it worked, met with our mechanics, right? Because there's a whole nother side. Like our mechanics have to become able to service electric vehicles, right? So um, we have great mechanics. So I, they're excited about it as well, right? In terms of what that brings. So, um, so yeah, so there'll be three charging stations. Um, so they're going to set it up to where it can be, you know, where the bus loading zones in. So eventually we can get two more buses or other vehicles. That, that can meet this need. And then, um, you know, in the future, 
I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get grants that put charging stations at our school sites and around the district. And I, I see this is probably going to kick off. You know, I, I'm hopeful that the governor's going to lot of state money right now that they'll put some money towards this kind of effort in, in terms of facilities. So, but we'll talk more about that at the study session on Thursday. All right. It's thank great you. news. So thank you. That's yes. great news. Thank you. 8.02 Ed Services update, Mrs. Frost. Yes, thank you. Just a couple of updates for you, starting with summer experience. Mr. Martin sent out an interest survey, and we are so happy to report that 90 of our current elementary, middle school, and high mm -hmm. school teachers have expressed interest in working in our summer program. And we have 47 of our classified staff who have already showed interest. So we see that as so promising to provide a really valuable program for our kids this summer. And then I think a couple of months ago, I gave you an I Innovate update where I told you that our TOSA, Sarah Garcia and Katie Peters, were co-teaching with classrooms. And at that time, they had co-taught with about 60 elementary teachers throughout the district. They are up to over 120 of our 150 teachers. So co-teaching with them, modeling these strategies, the challenging and engaging lessons, just a beautiful way to spread this strategy throughout our district. They're doing a great job. And then I just wanted to um, give a couple of follow-ups to our um, resolution discussion discussion this, this evening, and I think important things to remember as we move forward. We are going to continue providing masks on our campuses. If our kids want a mask, if a staff member wants a mask, that will be available on our campuses. And I, I we really take to heart and agree deeply with the conversation about children who choose to wear masks being able to do so comfortably and safely on our campuses. So we'll be working with our staffs on that. Um, also very um, serious about our kids who might have tenuous health, who might be immunocompromised, working with those parents to make sure they believe that they have a safe place for their kids in our schools. And then finally, reminding our staff that we have other mitigation efforts still in place. We want our kids washing their hands. We want to um, keep our, our ventilation systems active, our windows open, and then just be aware of classroom seating, location, that type of thing. So there's other mitigation strategies that we're going to remind our staffs about that will keep our kids and staff safe. Thank you very much. Uh, 8.03, Measure D update, Mr. Pinkerton. Yeah, just really quick, uh, facility master plan has been completed by PBK. So um, I know the board, we reviewed that length, you know, a lengthy uh, meeting with, at a study session recently, but I will be bringing that to the board March 15th for approval. So I'll, I'll share that. It's uh, been posted on, the, on our district website and of course on the agenda soon, but I just want to let the board know we'll be bringing that forward. Thank you. Um, um, Mr. Unger. Yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mrs. Frame. I'm really sorry. I just wanted to give a shout out to Mr. Holcomb, who took me yeah. to Morro Bay High School, gave me a, a tour of the facilities, the progress and things like that. Forgotten to mention that, but thank you so much to Mr. Holcomb for that. Um, Dr. Prater, we are at item 10.01, which is threat assessment and student safety. Um, it's about 10 minutes till 8 o'clock. I note that we would have a break at about 8.10. Would it be preferable to take a short break now? Okay, let's take a short break now. We'll take a break until eight o'clock right now, and then we'll begin with item 10.01, threat assessment and student safety. Thank you very much.
I've read about it for other districts. I know. That's great. But I think you have a good point. I think you might be able to Okay, if we could get everybody get back, we can start again, please. We have, I think that now, I think what we're about to hear from tonight is very important and going to be very interesting. So I look forward to hearing from Mr. Dowler and Dr. Holifield. No, I'm sorry, not you, Mrs. Frost. But, uh, <laughs> I'm just guess. going to open it and you're, then you're the just, experts come up you're here. The open, you're the warm up. Act. I'm the warm up, uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, Mrs. Frost. Yeah, absolutely. As um, Mr. Unger said, this is a very important presentation and we're really happy to have our two presenters with us this evening. I did wanna introduce them. Dr. Joe Holyfield joins us this evening. He's a clinical psychologist and a school psychologist and may be familiar to some people in this room because he was a school psychologist for San Luis Coastal for a number of years. He also has been a professor at Cal Poly and um, has expertise in the area of school behavior threat assessments. And actually during his time in um, San Luis Coastal, he worked diligently on our own process and actually worked with Mr. Dowler at the time. Chris Dowler is with us as well. He's the deputy director of student services and um, also the principal of Pacific Beach and does a number of things for the district, including working with our MFTs, attendance and discipline. And he is our district coordinator for threat assessments. So Dr. Holyfield's going to be sharing a model called BHARP with you. San Luis Coastal is partnering in this grant opportunity that he brought to us. And Mr. Dowler is going to talk about the process that we currently have in this district for threat assessments. So before I ask uh, Dr. Holyfield to come up and talk about the uh, Behavioral Health Assessment and Response Project. Um, I thought I'd go over what we do as a threat assessment um, process. So uh, in this slide, you can see we've included the purpose of a threat assessment. And the purpose is, is a lot of times kids will make, um, not, many times students will make an implied threat, which is I feel like killing people, um, a conditional threat, I'll kill you if you do X or hurt you if you do X. A symbolic threat could be a mysterious drawing that's cryptic or disturbing, or there are at times direct threats. And the purpose is to evaluate those possible threats and determine um, if they are in fact what the risk level is and then create a response plan according to that risk level. Um, the purpose is not to determine whether or not a threat was made, but to ask if someone has the ability or willingness to carry out harm to others. And the other purpose is to create a sense of psychological and physical safety among students and staff. Um, what I engage in most of the time is a level one threat response. So this is a site-based threat response that I go and coordinate with a group of um, uh, school psychologists. So that starts with a pre-assessment where the school staff or usually an administrator will call me and we'll talk about whether or not there's actually a need to pull in psychologists. Um, and then if we do, decide to pull in psychologists to conduct the threat assessment. Well, um, it's called a TAT threat assessment team assessment where we get to, or where we get a group of people together, usually psychologists, school staff, maybe a school resource officer, and we'll conduct a series of interviews. And um, these interviews will include both the student who is the offender, witnesses, teaching staff, administrative staff, counseling staff, um, parents oftentimes, so we will uh, usually interview multiple people in order to get as much data as we can around the incident. And then we'll make a um, determination of uh, probability, like what, what we think the threat level is. And then we create a series of recommendations to follow up on that. Now, of course, none of this happens if the threat is very direct and immediate. So oftentimes, or sometimes this will be superseded by police action, and then we can conduct a remote threat assessment, collecting data as much as we can from other people that were maybe were witness or party to the incident. 
it's good to know how many we do in a year. So on a low end, we'll do four. On a high end, we'll do 10. This year so far, we're at five, which sounds like we're right in the average range. But by the end of the year, I expect that this will be higher than probably our highest year to this point because it's been kind of a crazy year and March to June everything seems to accelerate so I'm anticipating that we'll be on the high end of an of a what I've conducted in the past. Um, our participation with BHARP, uh, Dr. Holyfield called me a couple of years ago right and he said I'm applying for this grant would you guys help out around threat assessments um, I've worked with uh, Dr. Holyfield in the past on conducting uh, threat assessment protocols in our district. Um, I think he has a really keen mind around this area. He's worked with some great um, talents and, you know, premier experts uh, nationally in the field. So I was really excited to help uh, work with him again. And um, so far, it's a, through funding and his grant, he's uh, provided trainings to school psychologists and site administrators. Um, from experts in the field of threat assessments. Um, he's consulted with us on doing uh, level one site-based assessments and looking at questionnaires and different strategies for conducting threat assessments. And it's allowed us to refine our process and make it better. Yes. Chris, I just have a quick question. On the, yeah. on the previous- Am I talking too fast? No. Okay. No, um, the faster you talk, the sooner we'll be. I got it. We'll I got the going memo. along. Right. I so got the no, memo. but I do have a question on the previous slide when you talked about the um, the recommendations and the um, the assessments. I'm sorry, the assessments you carry out each year. I'm assume I'm assuming, but I that's not a good thing to do. That these are primarily at the high school age group, or do they cover all age groups? Or um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we've had a I, I we've just, had an uptick this year in elementary threat assessments. Okay, sure. yeah, I was just curious about that, and that's that's data you you retain and kind yeah. of follow along on. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, and the last thing is, uh, Doctor uh, Holyfield has a group of countywide trained um, experts, and they will help us with level two threat assessments. That's where there is um, a threat that is made to the schools that might need outside agency support, whether that be CWS, law enforcement, maybe um, county mental health, or maybe there's other parties outside that work outside our schools or that live outside our schools that we need their help with. So he will help with the level two threat assessment support. Chris, you may wanna clarify what CWS is. Child welfare services, yep. All right, um, that is it from, did, Mark, did you have a question? Uh, uh, Mr. Dallar, a uh, quick question. So um, this is a grant. So is it, it's a one-time or is it gonna be funding an ongoing program? That's kind of one question. And then the other thing is, will the board be receiving um, data as far as kind of trends so that we can look, you know, what this year, but potentially, you know, look at how, what potential needs we need to uh, look at in the future. Yeah, I can do that. I can put together past years. It's a real small data set. We're talking four to 10 incidents a year that have like generated, you know, a, th a formal threat assessment response. Um, it's a small sample size of data, but sure we can do, I've been keeping data for about 10 years, so. And I'm sorry, is this, a, will this be kind of an ongoing program or it says it's a study, so. Our participation uh, with BHARP, I, I'll let Dr. Uh, Holyfield oh. talk about what he's doing in terms of like, I'm not sure about his grant cycles or the oh, okay. funding okay, levels, but my impression is the main purpose was to put together um, a community group that is trained experts and also to train school sites and how to oh, conduct, okay. you know, a really good solid threat assessment because there is no national template for mm. conducting a really good solid threat assessment in public schools k-12 so that's what we're trying to develop and that's you know what we're trying to work towards question great mr Dallar, um when you talk about a, is level two the highest level of threat assessment so far is yeah. there one and two okay so when you talk about a level two would an example of that be, and I know this has happened to us and to other districts, we might get a bomb threat 
and then it's and it's determined that that came from North Carolina, mm -hmm. you know, or something. But we go ahead and activate all of our protocols and procedures in response to that. That would be a level two. Probably not. I don't Probably know. It depends not. on what kind of data we're able to get. So the scenario might be like the situation where maybe the threat was made by a student, but there's perhaps family members that don't attend the school that have also engaged in threatening behavior or when there's multiple agencies perhaps involved and we need information from those agencies and we don't have a formal agreement with them or we don't have a contact. The idea was then um, Dr. Holyfield would have a group that does have partnerships in these multiple agencies that could share information around that threat because information sharing when there is a threat has been problematic in the past. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Chris. Oh, I'm sorry, Mark. Yeah, no, thanks. So. This is probably my, I just have this on my list for everybody, but so I may have missed it or maybe Dr. Holyfield's going to mention it. So parents involvement in this. So mm -hmm. we get a threat assessment. Um, is, is there a standard procedure that we're going to ask administrators to follow in terms of involving parents? Yeah, I get to. Say it. I get to. You yeah. <laughs> so I'm the one who's usually calm. I mean, it might be a site administrator, but so far this year, it's just been you know, me mostly talking to the parents and interviewing the parents and asking them a series of questions around, you know, the incident and their knowledge of the student and okay. maybe things that they might see at home. It helps us gather data to determine an appropriate threat level. Okay, thanks. And then second, um, may, again, I may miss this, but we have some, some, so there's sometimes there's like a graffiti threat or yeah. you know, a swastika, or I'm sure. pretty sure we've had this this year, or the N-word being sprayed at a school. Is that is that lead to anything from, might. From, the, from this? It might. Okay. It depends on you know, the other information that we get if there is actually a threat. But usually, so when I look at that four to 10, that's formal threat assessments where we've gone and interviewed people and actually done an, a full-scale investigation. Sometimes the preliminary threat assessment investigation portion, we determine that there's not a threat assessment that's required. So on any given incident that's reported to me, I'm at least doing a preliminary threat assessment to determine whether or not a full-scale formal threat assessment is warranted. So and let me add to that. So if, if there was a swat to get at a school site, I mean, I know there was at least one or two this year. It, does that, does the administrator know to call you? Or yeah. is that, yeah, okay. Nope, I'm sorry, I'm getting it from the community. I might be wrong. So I'm sorry, Eric's looking at me like I'm crazy. Well, you, you mentioned there's been two of them this year and I, I gave Evelyn sort of, she looked at me like, how come we didn't know about that? Yeah. Well, and my response in my eyes was, because, right. You didn't know about it. I didn't know about right. it, but I'd be, I will have some questions for you tomorrow. Yeah, sure. Not Thank you. <laughs> I, just, I just want to know that it's being taken seriously. That's all. Okay. All right. And so with that, I'll move on to Dr. Holyfield. We'll talk about the BHARP grant. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time. Um, so, um, Make sure. The Behavioral Health Assessment Response Project is a MHSA innovation grant. So it's funded through San Luis Obispo County Behavioral Health, but it's a competitive part of the Mental Health Services Act. So what they do, and I may answer some of your questions, is that they look at an innovative idea and give funding based on that. It's a competitive grant and um, where we test, we pilot something to see if it works. It's a project, a community-based project that I'm doing. Um, so we're testing a protocol. And then we use, it was a, it's been a four-year grant. The grant ends in June of 2023. Uh, and so we test and refine the protocol. We see how it works. We get feedback from the, our participants, the member districts, the other agencies, and see how, how it goes. Um, it's San Luis Coastal was one of the uh, several beginning partners in this project. And I wanna thank uh, Chris Staller and Diane Frost for they wrote a letter of support to the state uh, mm -hmm. to involve San Luis Coastal, a very nice letter, uh, which 
was entered into the, you know, the, uh, the California Department of Mental Health and they reviewed these and as well as uh, Cal Poly and a few other um, organizations. Um, and I appreciate all that support because they helped get the funding uh, to train the staff. Um, and then uh, Ryan Pink can help out with, you know, signing an MOU to allow me to work and do the training and, and work uh, and have staff attend. And, um, and then quite frankly, we had a, a training set up for uh, 2020. <laughs> this, all this money came pre-COVID. <laughs> and so uh, we had some goals set aside and we've been plugging forward and, and San Luis Coastal was gonna host the training in this room actually. And then um, of course, you know, with mask mandates and so forth, we couldn't do it. But the district was kind enough to allow our national experts uh, to present in one of the rooms up at the district office. Uh, and we did an online training in September, 2020 for San Luis Coastal's uh, uh, staff and, and a few other partner and community members. So I wanna thank the district for that. It was very, they've been instrumental. You guys have been instrumental as a district in this uh, community project. So what we're doing is, is really looking at uh, having national experts, John Vandrill, Dr. Manny Tao, our project consultants. So they're advising this, um, this grant in, in various ways from the community design piece to the clinical protocol. Uh, BHARP has several project goals that include training and coaching school threat assessment teams on an evidence-based protocol. So this is about an ev creating an evidence-based protocol. And we're collecting data to, on training and, and utilization of that protocol. We're creating a community advisory team of lo local experts trained in more advanced threat assessment skills. So that's that level two piece. And again, we're, we're just about to craft that protocol. And it's not necessarily like, you know, we're the Avengers coming in. Woohoo, we're, we're going to save, help you guys. It's an advisory team. We're going to test the protocol that's at a more advanced level. We use the level one um, assessment that a district might do. We advise them on it. And then people that have been trained in level two, uh, such as Chris and a few other school psychologists and, and mental health providers and law enforcement SROs will look at that and maybe do a follow-up on that protocol. Does that make, does that make sense? Um, so then part of that is, is designing and testing that uh, community team threat assessment protocol and then educating teachers and students on behaviors of concern, which you would hear in the media as warning signs, right? There's, there's been warning signs of things that have been known. Um, so why, why do we even need BHARP? Um, as you know, we've known since Columbine and there were school uh, shootings prior to Columbine, um, not all school administrators uh, received uh, threat assessment training and know about the process. Uh, sometimes students don't report concerning behaviors that they observe. This is what we've uh, learned in past school shootings. Teachers may not receive training on their role in a threat assessment process. Um, there is a loss of institutional knowledge from school district threat assessment teams. That oftentimes, we've uh, found in previous school shootings that uh, one of the threat assessment team leaders may have been a school administrator that may have moved up to the district office or a school psychologist that may have been at that high school now is in another high school. So now there's just a bunch of forms there and no one's been trained. And so when there's a serious situation, people are like scrambling, trying to find out what do we do, right? Um, so that loss of institutional knowledge piece. Um, school threat assessment teams may have no formal training in threat assessment. Um, sometimes uh, people just show up to the job and here's the folder for threat assessments. Right, so there's not this evidence-based coaching component. And then a school, what they've found too, is that even if a threat assessment's been done, some school shootings have occurred because the school didn't follow the safety plan of the threat assessment recommendation. So I'm not saying San Luis Coastal's doing this, I'm saying this is what we've, we've learned. These are the lessons learned and this, this grant's trying to fill the gaps in, in those. Um, situations. So this is the data on... So Joe, can I ask you a question? Yeah. So is what you're talking about pretty much exactly what happened in Michigan with their failure to, rec to recognize a threat of a student prior to a shooting? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, I don't want to say because I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't have access to the investigation data, but if you go back and look at open source documents, um, 
you know, we know that um, there were some concerning behaviors. Teachers took pictures diligently. We don't know if a threat assessment was conducted by the school district, right? We know they just met with guidance counselors and then called the parents, right? We don't know if they, the school, this, this is probably will come out, <laughs> you know, later on in the investigation, uh, whether the district had a threat assessment protocol and whether that was utilized or not. But that is a very good question. Yes. Yeah, I had the same question in my mind while we were talking about that particular incident. And as I recall, they they had the parents in there and they said, parents, you got to get them to a, a psych today or something like that. And they relied on the parents to do it instead of taking more authority themselves, I guess. I didn't read the parents correctly either as to their character. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've done a pretty detailed drill down and behavioral timeline of this situation based on open source information. And what you find in, is in those moments is that, um, you know, I think it was my understanding is just the counselors met with the parents and, and the, the student. Uh, they indicated that um, uh, 48 hours, they had 48 hours to get him counseling or they were going to contact uh, Child Welfare Services, right, make a report. Uh, so they're trying to encourage this therapy piece. Um, the other thing was, is that you know, had there been some type of, and, and we, in situations that, you know, I've worked with Chris Dowler in, in the past, you know, we may uh, put a student in another room if we're concerned and with, with a, uh, another teacher or something and talk more and, and try to, and we've had SROs search backpacks, search lockers, and, and, and they didn't do that. You know, had they searched the lockers, searched the backpacks, they would have found the gun, they would have found things in the, yeah. So uh, I think that's important information, you know. Um, so, I mean, threat assessments really trying to take someone and, and the goal of this project is to, there's a student that might be troubled, a student that's in need, assessing their concerns and diverting them off a pathway towards violence and trying to lead them into some type of mental health or some kind of support, and even supporting the, the family as well, if possible. So um, all good questions. Um, so the, one of the goals of the grant is training and knowledge. And we've had several different trainings in uh, 34, 34 school administrators, school counselors, and school psychologists from this district have participated uh, in the level one threat assessment protocol. They've been trained. Um, 28 school administrators and school psychologists did a one, one and a half hour detailed drill down of a a case that was presented by one of our experts last uh, June and went through the protocol and kind of took how the case, how they would apply the protocol. So that's the skill set that we're trying to, to learn from the coaching model. And then we distributed 28 level one threat assessment manuals. Uh, and and uh, each uh, of these participants have digital copies as well. Um, for the, the community network, the goal too is really trying to create this community network and get this level two uh, community um, group together. Um, Chris Dowler, Dustin Alexander have been attending monthly partners meetings. Um, Chris uh, Dowler, Liliana Thomas, and Dustin Alexander and Dean Johnson have, uh, Liliana and Dean are school psychologists. They've received the level two advanced threat assessment training. So now you have four individuals who have a higher level of expertise in the district that can work with the level one teams and so forth. Um, and then, um, you know, we've really, uh, we're moving forward with different goals. Uh, I've been working with Chris on trying to uh, kind of get this protocol together with the level two uh, Chris. component. Yeah, Evelyn? Oh, I guess this question might be referred to uh, Dr. Prater. Do we have um, based on you were talking about, um, you know, in, in, in prior incidents, prior uh, schools, the loss of institutional knowledge because somebody's moved somewhere. Do we have kind of a, a database that we're keeping kind of a record of this so that when that movement does occur, we, you know, retrain or, or put those people back in place? That's a really good question, most notably because we had, we hired nine new administrators. <laughs> last year. Part of the reason I've asked Dr. Holifield and Mr. Dollar to come here is they presented at the county level. And the one thing that jumped out, one of, this, one of many things that jumped out at me, and, and, and um, 
you know, Dr. Holderfield's not not uh, bragging on himself, but one of the things that he illuminated for us as county superintendents is the is while it's very important to work on the the preparation and reactive end, you know, your drills and all of those things, security fencing, all that. What's probably more important and in alignment to me as a former uh, teacher and site administrator for a lot of years, I knew the safest schools were the schools where, were schools where the adults knew every child. Inside and out were aware, knew names, and had um, a level of awareness where they were talking to each other. And that's what Dr. Holifield was saying is that the proactive side, not the reactive side, is where you're going to create your safest schools. Mr. Buckman, you mentioned tonight about the importance of working together and really yeah. trying to find that common ground among parents and stakeholder groups. Well, the same thing applies in our community and in our schools among our, the employees that work with kids. So important that we develop those relationships, that awareness, but to your point, Mrs. Frame, it's also important that we not have that institutional knowledge gone, leave us, and then we're left with people who don't know what they're doing. So yeah. there is a, a component to this where we will ensure we do maintain that institutional knowledge and we, we stage it in over time because we are having turnover and expect to continue. Can Dr. I, Holyfield? Yeah. Oh, just, uh, oh, just before we move forward. So in the, in the previous slide, we talked about community group several times and, you, and both you and Chris brought it up. So I'm kind of <laughs> interested in what, who's on these community groups that you're starting to put together? Yeah. Um, it, well, myself, I'm, I'm, I'm actually yeah, in but private you're, practice, you're, you're, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we have, um, Mental health, behavioral health, uh, family care network. We've had some people trained from them. Um, um, slow sheriff office. We've had some people, some SROs trained. Uh, we've had slow PD, Dustin Alexander, um, trained. Uh, we've had um, some drop-ins from Lou CMR, you know, starting to attend and, and part participate as kind of guest community uh, partners. We've had in the past, we've had some um, representatives from Cal Poly uh, that have also received Unified School District. We've had uh, um, Adam Heflin trained uh, in the level two component. So we have in San Luis um, County Office of Ed, we've had some representatives trained as well. So we're, we're expanding. Uh, we're having a K through 12 um, training that most of the uh, um, participants at San Luis Coast have already had, but Atascadero has expressed in interest, Lucia Mar. The goal would be have everyone trained, one community, one model, yeah. right? Everybody trained in the same evidence-based model um, that it's familiar to everyone, law enforcement, mental health, educational institutions. So you wanna triangulate that knowledge, that language of threat assessment to everyone. So when we're talking, we understand what, where everyone's coming from. So, it, so to me as a lay person, it sounds like there's like some overlap between an emergency response team that, that sets, I'm assuming we have in sites. It, and, it's and community emergency response. It's it's not necessarily a community emergency response team per se. We're we're not a service yet, right? We're it's we're testing a protocol, so I don't want to. We're not we're not a service <laughs> because the grant is supposed to test the implementation of some type of pilot project to see. Okay, now that the grant is over, how are you going to sustain this as a program? So it's a project. Hopefully, we can convert it into a community-based program at some point. So I don't, I don't know if this is a question for you, Joe, or for Dr. Prater or Mr. Dowler. Um, I'm hearing a lot um, about things that are going on in San Luis Obispo and San Luis Obispo High School. I haven't heard Morro Bay High School mentioned. Can you talk to me about what's happening at Morro Bay High School, please? It's the same. Same? Yeah, it's the same thing. So I, 
I'm, I'm I guess I guess mean. why I heard you talk a lot about Dustin and those guys, but I didn't hear you talk about like the SRO at, at Morro Bay High School, that type of thing. So I want to make sure that there's alignment between San Luis Obispo and Morro Bay High School, yeah. especially, um, you know, they, they've had their um, new administrators as yeah. well. Yeah, their administrative team has all been trained and they're, uh, I don't know if their SRO was even around when we did the training, so he might be too new for that. But um, their administrative team and their psychologists and counselors. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. And that is something we're having. In this all this training is free, you know, except for just the staff time to attend. So the venue, the the, the consultants, act, uh, the access to the national experts is free. And so if there are uh, professionals that work with the district that are important on these sort of assessment teams who. One to attend, we're having another one April 29th. On, uh, it's an all day training. Uh, so that would be something if, if uh, you know, the Morro Bay SRO would like to attend, or if there's other individuals who haven't attended with the district, they're welcome to attend. So, um, uh, and so um, just the next steps with the grant part of this is to, um, the grant is to provide. Uh, you know, education training to teachers and staff on concerning behaviors, you know, that those warning sign behaviors. Uh, we've been doing that with a few, um, we did that with Coast Union High School and then the middle school staff uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, another one is trying to, we've got additional grant funding for a student project on warning signs to create a warning signs video uh, for students, so for students by students. So part of the issue is that students don't report things. They see stuff, but they don't say stuff. So we want, it's called the code of silence. So we, we want, you know, we've reached out to, you know, be um, with Coast Union High School, their ASB teacher, student leader, um, teachers, and then uh, journalism teachers. Um, similar similar uh, aspect could go with uh, San Luis High and Marbury High. If those teachers want to have students become involved and kind of try to have students solve the problem. Uh, and figure that out. We have some funding to test a, a, a possible video that could be done to educate students on this. And then May 4th and 3rd, we're having, we got additional money. <laughs> um, we got it uh, in, in October uh, from the state to have focus on threats that aren't from students, right? So um, threats, uh, it could be a workplace violence issue. Uh, some school shootings have been by former um, teach or for, former staff uh, and threats uh, in that nature. Uh, so workplace violence, non-affiliated threats. So threats coming from outside the district, directed at the district. Uh, and so this is going to be a larger one uh, where district personnel, uh, HR, um, maybe labor negotiations, people can be involved as well as risk management professionals from school districts can attend this training and learn from Dr. Tao and Dave Okada are experts in this area as well. So uh, the Chamber of Commerce and I have been talking about this. We have a co-sponsored uh, training on this because the business community is interested in this as well. So, uh, and that's, that's, that's the BHARP project so far and really appreciate the, the district's uh, willingness to, to spearhead this really for the county. So before we take other, dis or other board member comments or questions, I believe there is somebody who wishes to address the board on this item. Um, and all, all I know is their initials are, I believe, AS, is that correct? So AS, if you're there, would you identify yourself and we'll get the timer up and you can begin your th two minutes? Hey, thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Very good, very good. You know, um, I understand, I understand that BHARP has come about as a, a, a way to kind of prevent some of the the degradation taking place in society, some of the the, the problems taking place with with youth and in school settings, and um, it ends up being a little bit of a band aid instead of addressing core issues. Um, you know, you know the code of silence talk uh, involving students to solve the problem. These these are nice things to get to say. Hey, you got to stand up to this situation. You've got to take control of the situation. You've got to deal with it the way you can. Um, th these are these are nice things, but we have to be looking at things like teacher-student familiarity, smaller class size, curriculum that matters to a student, 
student, a, a teacher that cares about how that teacher is speaking into the student's life now and into the future. You know, more involved teachers, less 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 teachers who are who are uh, there to collect a paycheck, as you know, the school district has a few. Um, so here we're we're. We have we have a two year period where students have been under such stress stress and such pressure, and this is a program that that it's almost created to to ignore the sources of the stress and the pressure in their life, and meant to slap a band aid on it in order to to uh, protect other students. And I get why it's needed. That's a very bad that's a very bad approach, though. I, I think the board should be very cautious of of working further with this grant. I think the board should be very cautious of working further with this program. I know it will take more time. I know it's harder. I just think the board has to look at more fundamental issues of what's going wrong in the district right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, board member questions or comments? I'm not seeing anyone. So I want to thank both Dr. Hollifield and Mr. Dowler for your presentation. Um, and we look forward to hearing more from you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, item 10.02 is proposed new secondary courses. Uh, Mr. O'Connor. Yes, good evening. Thank you guys for allowing me a few minutes of your time this evening. So I have the pleasure of bringing uh, some new secondary courses for your review and hopefully your approval. Um, they were submitted in the board docs. Perhaps, Mandy, if it's possible for you to maybe bring them up on the television. Um, we've got some new courses that we'd like to try and put on the books, um, both at the middle school and at the high school levels. Um, at the middle school, our Avid Excel class in our course, uh, specifically targeting our LTELs, our long-term English language learner students. And at the high school, we're very excited to start the process of bringing some of the courses to your attention that we've talked about in uh, our presentation about A through G and our pathway completion and trying to figure out a way to make sure that we be flexible, fluid, and nimble in our offerings for students. So we have um, our advanced leadership ag class. We also have a communication by design class, a geometry by design class, uh, constructing algebra two. Specifically, those are new courses that we hope to um, bring our staff and our students up to speed on in the coming years. The, the reason why I want to identify those specific courses, many of those courses um, are not only A through G approved, but they also meet the CTE pathway piece that we've talked about and trying to bring math um, alive to students in a constructive kind of uh, format where they're applying the math and building with the math. And also in the language arts area, communication by design, making sure that students have the opportunity to take an English language arts course that also would be aligned with maybe visual and performing arts. So we talked in a previous presentation about double dippers where they have that opportunity to be able to do that. We're also bringing to your attention tonight, uh, we had the pleasure of adding AP Biology and AP Environmental Science, but we want to make sure that we have an AP Biology Seminar offered at San Luis Obispo High School. And then finally, we want to explore the opportunity potentially of adding AP World History and Social Science. We currently have AP European History at the high schools, uh, but this is a course that we're realigning and College Board is retooling, and it's something that we would like to put on our books and then work with our staff in the coming years to have them trained at the uh, AP conferences to see if this is something we'd like to move in that direction. Great. Um, Mrs. Dawson, is there anybody from the public that would like to address the board on this item? Okay, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Mrs. Do Ms. Dobler-Drew. Um, as far as the CTE course for AB, the AVID students, why could that not be um, counted towards their redesignation. The AVID Excel course? Yes, the first one at the top, I can't see it right now. Yeah, yeah, uh, the AVID Excel course is gonna be, a, it's a middle school course that's specifically targeting the LTELs. Um, it's not a designated ELD course. Um, it's an elective offering. Obviously for the students to be redesignated, uh, we're looking at the, the assessment process for the language development so that we don't really put it in that category. That's why. Okay, I Thank get you. It. Thank you. Mr. Buckman, it looks like, and, and followed by Mrs. Frame. Thanks. Um, Leslie, I, these are great, and 
one of the things that appeals to me most is the linking of CTE and um, what we would call mainstream classes because I, I'm a firm believer that anything hands-on, people are gonna learn more and um, we're definitely moving in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. This is free. Um, Mr. O'Connor, a couple of questions. Um, you know, for the uh, secondary um, at the middle school, um, so for our long-term English learners, um, how does that, you know, recommend it if they is strongly recommend it and that they are, you know, rec if they take that, then they don't have an option to take an elective, correct? That is correct, absolutely. Okay. Do we have any, um, are we exploring any options about, you know, before school or I mean those after school or that's not a possibility? Yeah, I mean, ultimately what we'd like to move toward is um, having more opportunities for those elective opportunities at middle school specifically. Mm -hmm. If we wanna uh, explore the option of having more of an extended day opportunity for students at middle school, we, we're looking at that and working with the schools as well. If you think back to our middle school schools to watch, Right. Um, we're moving in that direction as well. Okay, and then my second question is, um, you know, these secondary courses um, certainly um, pique my interest regarding the uh, geometry and, and uh, the English courses. The one question I do have is, um, what would be, you know, I guess the one concern I do have is, is, um, is I noticed that there is, you know, the seminar courses that are potentially going to be offered at um, um, San Luis Obispo High School, it's third trimester. And it, it said in the course description, correct me if I'm wrong, that it's kind of designed to support passage of the AP test. So I'm wondering what would be an opportunity for Morro Bay High School students to have that same support within the day to to receive that support to help passage of, because there's, you know, this semester and I know it's a third trimester. So what would we do to kind of, you know, remedy that for our, you know, more of a high school students, I guess. Yeah, being very familiar with the AP seminar classes that are offered at San Luis Obispo High School, it's important to remember that a lot of times the AP seminar classes are actually still covering the content to make sure that the students have reviewed all the content for the examination because by March when the second trimester generally ends, the teachers and the students have not had full exposure to the content required for the examination. That doesn't exist at Morro Bay because they're they're on a semester system. So therefore they're working all the way up to the examination period, which is in May. So within that semester program at Morro Bay, they're inherently practicing and moving towards the examination that takes place then. At San Luis High, if a student completes the A and the B and it ends in March, many times our teachers are starting to cover all of the content by that point. So what you're saying is that, is that the design of the course at uh, Morro Bay High School does include that support? Yes, it does. Okay, okay. Um, okay. And do we have projected enrollments and does costs come into play with any of this? Yeah, it's a really good question. Right now we're projecting our enrollment in AP Biology to be between 60 and 70 students currently at San Luis Obispo High School. And that was the course we just designed and entered into this year. Um, and our AP World History, if we add that at either of the two sites, both Morro Bay and San Luis High right now have AP European History. Um, at Morro Bay, we have approximately about 30 students enrolled in AP European History. At San Luis High, it fluctuates anywhere between 75 and 100 students. Um, Mr. O'Connor, as always, you're well prepared and thank you very much. For you're very welcome. Dr. Eisendorf Rogers and then Mr. Buckman. I love the idea of constructing algebra as a person who barely crawled through algebra. I would uh, come to life thinking about how you would use it to build a house or to build a dog shed or you know, whatever it might be. So that's, that's fantastic. I love that. And I wonder if we could think about even doing that with um, programs that are more like history classes, which sometimes for some students might feel kind of um, dry. Um, and I wonder if we could think about how we um, put a, could put hands on the, the history classes and the, um, the AP seminar that we have there. Any possibility you think of 
blending those as well? Yeah, I think it's a, it raises an excellent, excellent question. It gives us an opportunity to research what's out there because there are districts and schools in the, in the country that are pushing the envelope. So part of the job will be to go out and search out those. So maybe next time around, I'll bring those to your attention. Yeah, or maybe back, bring, you know, some Shakespeare, <laughs> bring it together with the, yeah, what, we're, what we would be doing there. But Thank you. Love the idea. Mrs. Sheffer. I want you to bring uh, Shakespeare to uh, Geometry 3. <laughs> I, could um, I could imagine so what that looks like. Set, set design. So I, I just wanted to point out that I know that the AP biology has been requested for quite a while by some people in the community, by parents, and that, and with uh, world history as well, just to point out that sometimes uh, it's my understanding a reason that that at times these courses may take a while to be able to be offered is because the teachers need to have particular training and we don't always have the staff to be able to teach these programs. Am I correct in that? Yes. Um, however, with that being said, we do have teachers on staff who are fully credentialed at both of the high schools to be able to immediately start teaching AP biology. It's in place right now yeah. um, at San Luis High. It was not offered this year at Morro Bay High simply because of the lack of the demand from the student piece. Um, but the teachers are highly qualified and able to teach it. Uh, same goes for the social studies at AP World History. The reason why we're not gonna offer AP World History next year, but we're gonna start that review process is because there's a realignment on the college board piece with regard to AP World History. And we have to make sure that we um, invest wisely in whatever the um, book may be, the text mm -hmm. will be, but also, also allow the, the teachers to catch their breath a little bit. We've had a very successful AP European history program for the last nine years to make sure that they have that opportunity in the summer to go to AP conferences, to learn from their colleagues and to feel prepared because AP world history, the breadth of content is, is great. And uh, it's, it's something that we need to move cautiously toward and not just run into because our AP European history program is so strong. Right, so it takes a little additional just help support for the teachers to get get everything they need to be able to do this successfully. And I think that's that's also the case with our teachers who participate in the Cuesta offerings at our campuses. That is correct. Currently um, at, at Mora Bay High, the students that are enrolled in the AP European History class are also dual enrolled uh, for dual enrollment uh, credit at Cuesta. Okay. So, um, and uh, I think also that that plays into why sometimes course offerings may are different at the two different high comprehensive high schools at Morro Bay and San Luis Obispo High School, um, especially with regard to the dual uh, enrollment. Is my understanding that is correct? Yeah. So as well as as well as uh, student interest in the particular course. That is correct. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Mr. Buckley. Thanks, Chris. I, help me understand. So right now, there's classes offered at, at every semester in every period, and we're going to add these courses. And I'm just trying to figure out how they're going to fit into the day. So I hope part of this answer is the summer experience is going to open up all this new time and all these new opportunities. But seriously, I you know I mean we have a, we have a good curriculum offering. Yeah, it, it, we we. We are blessed in our curriculum offerings. Um, if you're thinking about AP World History, maybe the displacement of AP European History with AP World History. If you're thinking about um, a pathway in construction, you have a situation where you maybe be able to offer construction through algebra or algebra two or geometry by design, where all of our 10th grade students would be in a geometry class because they would be taking geometry in 10th grade normally or ninth grade normally. And they would maybe be, uh, have the opportunity of exposure to that particular construction pathway. Um, when you're looking at students who would be taking either 11th or 12th grade English normally in their um, trajectory in high school, they would perhaps be part of that visual and performing arts pathway. So there's a way to weave them in so that they were taking them anyway and they would have access to a pathway. It's subtle, but profound on the part of the students. I guess I'm really glad I'm not trying to figure out student schedules. 
yeah, you're lucky on that one. Okay, Mrs. Friend. I'm sorry, Mr. O'Connor. Um, one of your comments kind of um, made me think about a, another question. What do we do for, um, you know, when you mentioned, uh, which made perfect sense to me about the, the need for the, uh, the, the, the seminar and, and, you know, because we're not able to get all the content in and, but what about for those learners that are maybe struggling learners and they, Maybe in their in, in their section they have two trimesters of English, but they really need a continuity of English throughout the year um, and our math. Do we how do, how are we addressing that for those particular learners? We have this option, this great option and needed option for the AP, but how are we addressing that for the struggling learners? Uh, great question. So our students obviously at Slow I in Algebra One have all three trimesters of math. Okay. Geometry, all three trimesters of math, and algebra two, all three trimesters of math. Um, so they have that access. A student who's currently an EL student at Slow High will have their designated ELD mm -hmm. as an ELD one, two student in the first trimester, and then they're cycled into their respective grade level English course. Um, if they're a three or a four, if they're a one or a two, they'll remain in that ELD one or two. So they're having access not only to the English language arts, but they're also having access to the designated ELD throughout the entire year on a daily instruction. Okay, so did, okay, yeah. perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Great, anybody else from the board? This is an action item, would someone like to make a motion? Yeah, I'd really like to make this motion. Okay. I'll second. Second. Motion by Mark, second by Evelyn. Any further discussion? Mr. Buckman? Aye. Mrs. Frame? Aye. Ms. Dobler-Drew? Aye. Dr. Eisendrath Rogers, Mrs. Roger, yes. Mrs. Sheffer, yes. and I'm a yes. Motion carries 7 0. Uh, 10.03 A to G completion improvement grant. Mr. O'Connor, you're back up. Yeah, I am. Thank you. And I've had the pleasure of working with Mr. Pinkerton, Mrs. Frost, and Mrs. Eckland about this uh, A through G uh, completion grant that's being made available by the state. Um, this is kind of our first review as we submit this. This uh, grant has to be submitted to the Department of Education by April 1st. And essentially, uh, the grant that you have in front of you is really looking at um, a recovery for students who may have received a D or an F, um, either in 2020 or in 2020. 2021 during the height of the pandemic. So think about those students who got received a D or an F and we are looking to find and be supported through this application ways to make sure that the students have a C or better because obviously we know the linkage between the C or better for A through G and college acceptance. Also the ability to have credit recovery programs, whether that be an after school program, whether that be a intercession or whether that be through summer enrichment. So these funds would allow us to be able to bring that to our students. On the second part of our application, we're looking at A through G success, and we're very strategic in the five areas that we're looking at. We want to build our knowledge around our course review for A through G. We obviously want to make sure that all of our courses are A through G approved, ideal situation. We want to think about leveraging A through G options for our EL1 and 2 students. It's imperative that students who are second language learners have the access to an A through G approved course. There are courses out there in some of the districts in Southern California that have that already. Um, we also want to make sure that our CTE programs and our courses, much like we've just reviewed in our previous piece, are CTE and A through G approved, because again, that gets greater return on the investment on the part of the student. We also want to increase our awareness among our counselors and our teachers about the A through G process, specifically with our middle schools. This is where it's really, really important to build that awareness and knowledge amongst our middle school counselors and our middle school teachers to understand the complexity of A through G and why it's so, so important. At the same time, AVID is key. So in a third area within this uh, access grant that we're looking to apply for funds that may support AVID tutoring, awareness amongst our AVID students, our parents and our outreach. And the final two areas that we can apply for is regard to AP, AP professional development, AP tests if necessary for unduplicated students, and maybe reviewing opportunities for staff to bring maybe pre-AP courses onto our course catalog. So again, working with Mr. Pinkerton, Mrs. Frost, 
we're looking at applying for these grants that are made available to us. And this is our goal to increase our awareness and recovery efforts around A through G. Okay, this is a first reading. Um, I will go to the public. Is there anyone from the public that would like to address the board on this item? Okay, seeing no one, I'll bring it back to the board again, the first reading. Are there comments or questions from board members? Mrs. Sheffer? Mr. O'Connor, you know, you and I have spoken before about my strong belief in A through G courses and that this provides combined with uh, the various pathways we have, but I'm a big believer in making many as many courses as we can A through G because it keeps, it opens more and more doors to all of our students. And that's kind of how I look at, at one of our jobs in public education is to provide our students with as many doors as possible that they can then explore and walk through when they leave here in whatever configuration or order or timetable they may choose, but to have those doors available to them. So I really appreciate um, uh, the your wor hard work and dedication to uh, the A through G process for our students. So thank you for that. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, this is a first reading, so it will be brought back, I'm assuming, to the next meeting. It will. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. 10.04, uh, complete CSBA delegate assembly ballot. Dr. Prater. Yes, <clears throat> I'm excited to announce that Mr. Buckman is the sole candidate <clears throat> for the CSBA ballot. Um, and, and we know how committed he is. And and the hard work that he puts in. And uh, I recommend your approval for Mr. Buckman to represent us for the Region 9C representative in San Luis Obispo County. Great, thank you. This is an action item. Mrs. Uh, Dawson, is there anyone from the public that would like to address us on this? Seeing no one, I'll bring it back to the board. And actually, uh, go ahead, Ms. Dobler. Oh, just... I, I, it might be in here somewhere and I didn't see it, but do you, do you, what, what will you, the duties be uh, in a nutshell? Mr. Buckman, do you want to talk about that? <clears throat> yeah, so CSBA, um, this, the board of the delegates, the delegates discuss some of the top issues that are in the state of California. They direct the um, CSBA's program. But also there are committees that CSBA board members sit on. So I was lucky enough to sit on the Climate Change Task Force, which created um, a set of resources for school boards to go to and, and look at. I sat on the um, annual conference, you, I think you attended um, the annual conference committee and created the conference. And um, I can't remember several other committees. Um, CSBA, for example, writes um, all the board policies that we approve. And um, I'm honored to, to, to be there. Chris um, served as the president of CSBA. And I'm wondering, Chris, if you have any other, sure. yeah, any other delegate, yep, there delegated are, delegate. Sure, there are, there are a couple of things um, that, that also the delegate assembly does. The first thing is they, they approve what's called the policy platform. Um, the policy platform is the, are, are the ideals really um, that guide CSBA's uh, legislative activities and, and CSBA's um, executive executive uh, portion. Um, that's one part of it. The delegate assembly also approves the bylaws for CSBA. <clears throat> and then importantly, they elect the officers of the California School Boards Association. So those are just some of the things that mm. the delegate assembly does. And I, I thank you for reminding me, I forgot. So, and, and I was uh, fortunate enough to serve on the policy platform committee. Right which um, those policies, that um, strategic type planning is, is still in place. And, and for, the, for which I gave you a lot of grief on one of yeah, the issues. Yeah, I know, I know. <clears throat> but um, it, it's been quite an experience to work with um, uh, school board members from around the state and to bring back some of those ideas to the county. And, and I, with, with the board's permission, I'd like to go ahead and make the motion to approve this item. Is there a second? Second by Mrs. Sheffer. Is there any further discussion? Uh, I'm a yes. Mrs. Sheffer? Yes. Mrs. Roger? Um, Dr. Eisendrath Rogers? Ms. Dobler Drew? And Mr. Buckman? Oh. 
Whoa. Motion carries five with uh, five ayes, one abstention, and one uh, absence. So thank you very much. Congratulations, Mr. Buckman. Um, moving on to the action consent agenda, please let me know if you'd like an item pulled. Approval of certificated and classified personnel items. Acceptance of donations. Approval of foreign exchange organizations. Approval of furniture and equipment requests. Approval of new position grounds worker. Approval of purchase orders and CalCard purchases. Chris, I'd like to pull 11.06. 11.6, hold on just a second. Thank you. Uh, 11.07, disposal of surplus. And 11.08, approval of warrants and payroll. So if someone would like to make a motion for 11.01 .01 to 11.05, 11.07 to 11.08. I'll um, move approval of 11.01 .01 through 11.05, 11.07 and 11.08. I second. Okay, second by Ms. Dobler-Drew. We have a motion by Mrs. Roger and a second by Ms. Dobler-Drew. Um, Dr. Eisenrath Rogers. Uh, Ms. Dobler-Drew. Yes. Mr. Buckman? Yes. Uh, Mrs. Mrs. Sheffer? Mrs. Roger? This yes. meeting is and being recorded. Is. Ooh, well, it's good to know. Um, <laughs> motion carries 6-0. Mr. Buckman, you pulled 11.06. Yeah, so I'm gonna have, um, I sent this ahead to uh, Ms. Eklund, but um, I'm not gonna look for some, I just, I'm, I am specific, I'm very interested in what we bought from sd.com designs by Judith. So sometime in the future, if I could get that. I was also pretty amused by us buying um, some purchases from Zorro tools. I don't know if those were swords, and, but I was kind of interested in that. Um, grounds workers. Grounds workers got the, got the swords. Okay. Um, and then um, there were some, some payments to Sloco. I'm sure that Katie will call me tomorrow, but. Um, and those are for deaf and hard of hearing. Okay. Purchases for the oh, county. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, so with that, not sure like, about the Etsy one, but I'll find out. Yeah, for let's you. find that. Absolutely. Um, so um, with that, I have some other questions, but I'll ask those uh, of Katie. So I'll move approval of eleven point oh six. Someone like to second that? Second by Mrs. Sheffer. And because that item was pulled, we do need to go to the public. Mrs. Dawson, is there anyone from the public that would like to address us on that? Seeing no one, I'll bring it back to the board. Uh, Mr. Buckman? Yes. Mrs. Sheffer? Ms. Dobler-Drew? Yes. Dr. Eisendrath Rogers? Mrs. Roger? And I'm a yes, motion carries 6-0. Uh, 12.02, advanced agenda. Okay, seeing no one, I'll bring it back to 13.01, reports by board members. Anybody have anything they'd like to report? Yeah, thanks. Um, just real quickly, I um, was invited to attend um, uh, the, one of the one of the el elementary school basketball games. Evidently, the elementary schools have put together each school has a basketball team, and I have to tell you, I went to a second one on my own. And anybody that wastes their time watching pro sports has not seen the heart and the skills and, um, of these of these. Uh, great athletes. Um, I also visited the uh, family resource centers, um, both at um, CL Smith and Hawthorne. I, I met Cynthia Ortiz Corona at Hawthorne and Arlene Merced at CL Smith. These are really dedicated folks. They know their communities. Um, and it was, it was really heartening to see because this is still a fairly new program for us. Thanks, Chris. You're welcome. Anybody else? Well, I, I've got one, um, and actually, I've got some some sad some sad things to talk about. Um, the first is that on Saturday, I attended the memorial service for Dan McShane, who was a longtime custodian at Del Mar Elementary School, a beloved longtime custodian at Del Mar Elementary School, Mr. Dan. Um, there were probably seventy five people there. Um, you know, as, as at all memorial services. Uh, people were asked to share remembrances of Mr. 
Dan. And the most pointed of them were probably from the students, from the older students who remembered him and remembered his kindness um, and the influence that he had to make all students feel welcoming and welcome and comfortable at, at Del Mar Elementary School. So, um, so we wish Mr. Dan um, in his memory the very best. There is a GoFundMe account at Del Mar for Del Mar Elementary School to provide, to raise money for a friendship bench in Mr. Dan's name. So if anybody's interested, you can contact Del Mar Elementary School for that. And then um, I'm particularly saddened to report the death of Carol Colley. Carol was a longtime secretary at CL Smith School. I know Mrs. Sheffer um, knows her. I, I knew her well. My wife, of course, taught at, Del, at CL Smith Elementary School. Um, I, somebody wrote me today about her and just talked about what a light she was at that school and um, what a what a what a wonderful, positive person. You'd walk into her into the office and you would be enveloped by her love and her kindness and her care for students. Um, I, I, we don't know when her memorial service will be, um, but it, it was a great shock to the community. And um, we just wanna send her family our, our, our most sincere condolences and, um, you know, God, God bless you, uh, Carol Colley, thank you. Is there anybody else? Otherwise, um, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>